call to order the April 17th Allatan County Board of Supervisors workshop meeting. Mr. McClellan, if you would help us with the Pledge of Allegiance. Mr. Williams, if you do the invitation. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Here in the Father, thank you for another wonderful day in Power Canyon County. And all our many blessings. Amen. Amen. Do any requests to postpone agenda items, additions, deletions, or changes in the order of the presentation? A motion for approval of the agenda. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Can I administer your updates? No updates this evening. That will bring us to our first public comment period where anyone from the public who wishes to speak to the board, please feel free to do so. You're speaking on behalf of the individuals. You have three minutes. You're speaking on behalf of the group. You've got the five minutes before the. Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, Albert Conley. Uh, I'm here actually to speak about the uh, community matters. Um, as people retire and they become uh, up in age, they become more homebound. Mr. And, Tom, yes. Can you tell us your address, please? Yes, 2092, the end of the new place uh, here in Beltan, Scottville. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And uh, and what we, we, like a lot of other people that are retired, will scoot out for the winter for a couple months. And as we scoot out for a couple winters, what we do is we look for two things. One is social interaction. And the other one's warm. So, you know, anyway, as we go away, we, we are in a very, very active community. My wife and I are extremely active. And when I say active, we're talking about not so much the mind developing things and the physical developing things. We're after the enjoyment, the laughter, the fun things. And at Community Matters, they have, uh, we've contacted them and, and interfaced with them. They have a, a lot of really good activities over there. But what we have is a little, we're going to start some new games over there, and we're trying to make people just have fun. You can go over there and you get your exercise, you can do your stuff, or you can go to the Y and do your stuff. You can go over here and play Mahjong. But when we go, <laughs> as we go, we have fun games. And it's very difficult to play fun games in a room when they're playing Mahjong. <laughs> so, you know, they're very deeply concentrated, working on their minds, and we're on games that are fun. People laugh, and uh, if you don't laugh, you don't, you just don't grow. You don't go, you know. So anyway, you have to go away. As an example, um, I, my wife and I, about two weeks ago, we, have, we're walking, and I said, okay, we saw a couple of people, and I said, tomorrow at one o'clock, we're going to play a board game in our in our house, and we're looking for, you know, six new people, you know, just to come in and have fun. And I had twenty two people show. Up. And they were from Macon, <laughs> Cartersville, and a lot of them from in and around Caltech. And they were all people that are our age and some of them a little bit older. They were there just for the fun and enjoyment. And so we couldn't turn them away. So we backed our cars out of the garage. We got lawn furniture, set it up in there, and we played the, the games. And it was fun. Everybody laughed. Everybody joked. Everybody had a good, really good time. And so as they went away, that's when we went to Community Matters to see if we could you know, make this an ongoing thing and have a space. And uh, so as it was, we turned out, we, they have one room and it's hard to do. So that's, uh, that's basically what I'm doing is I'm here to promote another space, another room, or some other place where we can continue these games. Yeah. All right. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, sir. Anyone else? Anyone online? Okay, we'll close the public comment period. Go into new business. We have the uh, Parks and Rec Advisory Committee with us tonight um, to uh, present. They have a, a number of topics, uh, bylaws, going over the needs assessment, and talking about some of the PIP projects that relate to parks and recreation. So we have uh, several of the members of that tonight um, Mr. Palmore, Mr. Flanagan, and Mr. Kavanis um, here with us as well to present. Great. Wonderful. Gentlemen, welcome. 
Glad thank to have you here. Yes, well, thank you. We appreciate uh, the opportunity to get with the board of supervisors and present a few things. Um, we do have a, a PowerPoint presentation we'd like to go through. Um, the first off, I'd like to start again by thanking you guys for the opportunity to uh, meet with you and uh, kind of give you some updates, uh, present some new items that we've been working on, and uh, thank uh, Megan and Zach for their hard work uh, in preparing uh, the presentation for us this afternoon um, and a lot of the new information that we are getting from the Parks and Rec Department. Um, some very valuable information for us and helping to advise the board on what we feel are some uh, some good actions moving forward. So um, we can start with the presentation. I guess the first piece uh, we have is our agenda. We can go to slide two. Um, just the few items we wanted to discuss this afternoon. We do have some bylaw revisions that we'd like to uh, present to the board. Um, we want to do a quick needs assessment review. Um, from our 2019 needs assessment that was done and then present um, our recommendations from the parks and rec committee um, for the cip um, we'll go on to the next slide uh, to our bylaw revisions uh, with the addition of um, the parks and rec department um, we had some wording changes uh, in the bylaws i think those are provided in your packet um, one to uh, change the number of members, um, seven members with five uh, members being nominated, um, one of the five uh, from the Board of Supervisors, um, two members nominated by and voted on by the Board of Supervisors as at-large members, that would be the seven after the five nominated from the Board. Um, changing some wording from the previous uh, chair or the previous um you being parks and rec being the utilities department to the parks and rec department so some word in there um we'd also like when this um with these bylaw changes one request is that we have a member from the board of supervisors um be on our commission and sit in to hear hear the processes and the discussions that we have on a monthly basis um, help keep you guys surprised what's going on um, opportunities like this are are great but uh, on an ongoing process uh, have a member from the board sit on our commission um, let's see another is that the appointed members shall serve shall serve two-year terms just some verbiage change there um, other some other just some spelling some clarification of a few items so that that's there for you to review um main main things being naming the director of parks and rec as the secretary of the parks and rec advisory commission and then again appointing one representative from the board of supervisors as a non-voting member now those are the two big items um, i'd like to request with our bylaw changes So I believe those will be those requests will be coming to you to vote on um, during a regular meeting. Um, you know, that's I believe is protocol for bylaw changes to our commission. Um, any questions? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Yes, go ahead, Mr. Cox. Um, Mr. Palmer. Yes, sir. With two year terms. Mm -hmm. It's almost impossible for you to have a staggered board. Yes. I mean, that, that just makes it makes the potential churn much more likely to happen. Correct. So why why limit it to two years? Well, to address the first concern of the staggering of the board, um, a couple of years ago, we and this is enumerated at the bottom of that page one of the bylaws, we staggered which you know which uh, district would be nominating folks to try to uh, address that concern. Um, two years, um, I think that was, I think that was in the original bylaws. Um, I think it was, uh, yeah, trying not to get, you know, people burned out, trying to make it palatable enough for people to volunteer and, uh, and sign up to hopefully be nominated. 
Um, but yeah, to address that concern of a massive change, that's why we staggered the, the nomination process. Well, I understood the staggering, mm -hmm. but, but since it's only two years, then it means you're constantly now every year new members will be taken, okay? And then the whole introduction process starts again. I understand the Correct. I understand the problem of recruitment. Sure. Okay. Um, I just I believe that, that was that, that, that was really, I believe, a carryover from the original bylaws where it was set up as two year term. Does it seem to be working? So far. <laughs> Good enough? Sure. <laughs> Any other questions? How, how do you plan to, to seek these two outside uh, members in terms of speaking with Mr. Cox, the recruitment? You know, you're going to get two outside people. What one of one is a school representative, uh, which has typically been the facilities uh, member. Um, so that covers one. Uh, the other, we've been, we've struggled with it over the years. Originally, when the commission was formed, the mem the the other non-voting member was intended to be a high school age student. Um, to help give us ideas from the younger age group. Um, we struggled with getting students to sign up. We uh, worked with the guidance counselors at the high school at Blessed Sacrament. Um, we did have one young member uh, who served briefly before he went off to college. Um, but um, that's why we you know, were looking to, to change that a little bit to one, get somebody from the board, and then the other being from the schools. You want the five districts represented, then you want two others, and then you want a board member on top of that, correct? So, <clears throat> we went through so many iterations of this. I'll, I'll just, but, but, I mean, yeah. what you were saying. Yeah. You have five, five guys or, or, or people, members now, that are on the parks of Conrad. Represented from each district in the county. That usually the supervisor makes the connection and finds that person at least tries to um, in collaboration with you guys. And then we have what you're looking for is two other members of the community at large to join the advisory committee and then have uh, an ex officio, a member of the board of supervisors, be in. Is that am I right there? Correct. Yes. Okay. One of the things, Mr. Chairman, is that. Having an ex officio from the Board of Supervisors, at least they have an idea and bring back to the other board members of what we're doing on a, on a monthly basis uh, and hear our concerns or hear our uh, citizens' concerns. Uh, when citizens come to our board and, and ask for something, at least it gets passed towards the uh, uh, supervisor and you're aware of what we're dealing with. So it's, I think it's better communication between the commission and to, and to the Board of Supervisors. Right. And, and I would agree with you, wouldn't disagree. Um, and it at least gives an ample opportunity to be able to communicate through that both boards and have like a liaison from both boards to both back and forth to get things accomplished. My past experience of working with commissions in Canrico, we always had a, a next issue from the board of supervisors who sat on our commission. Yeah. Mr. Chair? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, do you think it would be, since recruitment's a little bit of a challenge, why not just do the five district representatives, one next officio from the board and one from the schools? And, I mean, if you really, if you have five representatives from the, you know, community, do you really need two more at large? Yeah. I've just thrown it out of recruitment. I don't, well, think, it, I don't, I don't think, think it's necessary. I think we were trying to, from the, again, from the original bylaws, the intent of the younger, um, yeah. the younger <laughs> student trying to fill that position um, as an at-large member. From the from the community that would be a non-voting member. Uh, frankly, no, I don't know that it's necessary for us to to operate and you know advise the the board on you know things that we're hearing from the parks and rec side of things. Um, again, it was just more so trying to fill that position in another way, you know, honoring the original bylaws. Any other questions? Yes, yes, sir. Mr. Not to beat this to death, but mm -hmm. at large uh, is. Selected by the Parks and Rec Advisory Commission. Yes, sir. And they are for how long? And you don't have to have them. As I read this, you don't have to have those two people. I mean, if you find them, you can. Correct. But, but you're not 
you, you've got to have one from each district. Yes. So you know, yes. So you're at large. Uh, can be chosen by the commission. Mm -hmm. uh, do they have a term? Is it two years? Uh, yes, I think it would be two years. Okay. And I don't believe they have to have those positions. Don't have to be yeah. filled if you cannot find the right person. Correct. Correct. Yes, and we and we have operated without that position being filled for quite some time. Uh, yeah, with our five five voting members, as long as we have a quorum of three, um, yeah, we have yeah, to go. we're able to operate and have our meetings and move on. So. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? All right. Um, moving on to reviewing the needs assessment. Um, again, in 2019, uh, the department conducted a needs assessment uh, with Pro's Consulting, um, outside firm that was hired to administer um, surveys throughout the county and prepare the needs assessment. Um, and with that, they identified the needs of the community. Um, they create the foundation and development of a roadmap for future development of the recreational facilities and opportunities for the county. And that was looking out 10 years. Um, the plan was based on um, recognized park planning principles and standards and it reflects the input from residents and stakeholders in Powhatan County, um, staff, Parks and Rec Advisory Commission, and supervisors. Um, just a bit of a review. Um, go back. Oh, sorry. You're good. Um, with that, um, with that assessment, the the mixed methods that were used, they did an online survey. Um, it was 540 completed surveys uh, representing you know a little over 2,000 uh, county residents. Um, it was a statistically valid survey with 421 completed surveys, uh, which gave them a 95 percent level of confidence. Um, they were conducted uh, different focus group meetings with schools, chamber of commerce, athletic groups, um, and uh, the development community. A lot of some they invited them, some of the local. Uh, commercial residential builders to yeah, see what kind of needs they felt that they were hearing um, through community meetings. Um, again, that was uh, completed with Pros Consulting, who was our outside consultant there. Um, I believe in your packet, I believe there was a copy of that needs assessment. There's also the link um, that can be provided. Um, move on to the next slide. Yeah. Um, this slide is showing some of the results from the uh, from the survey of the uh, different program areas, and these these categories were taken directly from the needs assessment, and they were grouped into high, medium, and low. Uh, yeah, because from a priority standpoint, um, from that list, the indoor recreation. Uh, program needs. You can see there was fitness and wellness. And these are these on the right are listed in somewhat chronological order from the from the group on the left. So you had a fitness and wellness program, community special events, um, adult 55 plus program and services, indoor archery, um, out of school programs, camps, uh, performing arts programs, adult basketball, and programs for special needs. Um, <coughs> The and that list is all things that could be incorporated into a new indoor recreation facility. Um, currently, the county's indoor recreation facilities include a gym and one meeting room um, at the Pocahontas Landmark Center. Um, as of the end of March um, of this year, we had almost 4,700 total participants attended either a um, attended the Center for Parks and Recreation Programs, being either a sports practice um, facility rentals, uh, museum open houses, partner group programs, and community meetings. Um, those, are not, those are not unique touches, but those are total numbers of people that came to um, the different, uh, for different programs there. Um, just also to point out the gym um, at the Landmark Center, 
that from November to February during the winter months, the gym was booked 100% um, during, the, during the weeknights of two groups being pulse basketball and momentum volleyball and both are uh, paying renters of that space. But so every every weeknight from November to February, beginning of February, it's booked 100%. So it's uh, it's definitely being utilized. I think it's a great investment by the county to refurbish that gym and, and uh, have that space available because um, it's definitely being utilized. Um, let's see. Um, Go on to the next slide. Okay. <clears throat> this uh, this is some data from the from the needs assessment. Um, you can see currently the largest age segment in Powhatan is 55 plus age group, uh, making up 33 percent of the population. Um, 55 plus demographic is projected to increase over the next 15 years, um, based on the you know, growth projections. That would put us at about 43% of the population by 2033. Um, recreational needs and interest of active aging adults in the community can be expected to expand because of this growth. And this unbalanced population segment is not unique to Powhatan. <clears throat> One fifth of the United States population will be 65 plus by 2030. This accounts for the baby boomer population. Um, enhanced medical technology, healthy trends, and people living there. Um, so you can see that, you know, again, this is not unique to Powhatan, but uh, for our community, over the next, you know, 10 years, we're looking at 43% being in that 55 plus age group. Um, the Senior Action Committee had approached our uh, commission uh, to request support for an indoor recreation facility dedicated towards the aging adult population. Um, they provided us a presentation, um, the concept of a senior center in the 21st century, um, you know, revamped and innovated to provide a one-stop shop um, with ease of access for socialization, physical activity, lifelong learning opportunities, enrichment programs, health and wellness. Um, Four things that came you know, out of that were reiterated throughout that presentation um, was there was a desire for a community center that creates a sense of belonging, um, you know, a place that people feel at home, you know, not that they're you know, put out, but a place to gather and, and feel as a, as a, you know, a place that they belong. Um, social connectedness is important um, as our, you know, as uh, our uh, Community time, we heard, you know, the aging community is looking for that social activity, um, you know, in, in lots of different ways. Um, retirees and adults are choosing to live in rural areas, um, moving out of the cities and moving to places like Powhatan, but uh, but looking for the, those social um, abilities. Um, a place for accessing resources in the area is a unique challenge. Um, you know, we, we being spread out like we are, you know, you know, having a lot of those interactions is difficult for any community. So having a place like a community center to gather and uh, have different events um, is what a lot of folks are looking for. Um, that that committee contacted eight different centers out of the 80 senior centers um, that are in Virginia um, to look at the way they are operated the activities they provide the way they're funded. Um, the research concluded that facilities are mostly funded through cities or counties and operated through the parks and rec department. Um, the parks and rec commission and the senior action committee uh, came to a consensus that the needs for a 55 plus population could be met by a community recreation center open to the needs of the whole community and designated senior program times and locations. Um, one thing that was reiterated is, yeah, in an overall community center, um, <coughs> 55 plus group and the senior action committee had pointed out that, that having a space designated or generally used by that aging community, um, again, provides that um, sense of belonging, a place to gather. 
Um, <clears throat> Um, move on to the next slide. Um, this is just a quick slide of some of the different uh, programs that are trending in the you know, recreation areas uh, for 55 plus. We've got the culinary classes, uh, people you know, coming together, learning how to cook, having cooking classes, uh, group fitness classes, uh, painting and art classes, and uh, ceramics and pottery is a, um, a growing area that a lot of people are getting involved with. So just wanted to point out some of the different programs. Um, you know, and in that eight that 55 plus population, you do have some work adult, working adults, um, retirees, and then also very active seniors. Um, the current rec facility at the Landmark Center does not have a kitchen, group fitness, or dance studio, or nor does it have a multi-purpose room for art classes. Um, pointed out to us and never really think about it to you You're trying to put one on but our classes don't work well in areas that are carpeted <laughs> um, and so the one the uh the meeting room there is a carpeted space so you know that was just it's one of the hindrances to being able to offer some programs um, data has shown uh willingness um from staff to utilize the existing recreation facility to maximize potential. Um, you know, Megan and uh, and Zach um, have been doing everything they can to utilize the space there um, and uh, offering as many programs and partnering with different groups um, in the community uh, to provide different uh, opportunities there. Um, the existing facility um, uh, such as the y uh, other existing facilities, such as the YMCA, um, charge a membership fee, and their facility is already overbooked. Um, YMCA has been renting the gym and the classroom space at the Landmark Center and utilizing the library to offer other recreational programs. So there is a need for a community center. Um, yeah, just through their programs and being overbooked and them not having space and trying and renting ours as much as they can. Um, go on to the next slide. Uh, go to the next one. Um, so this is um, our recommendations uh, for the CIP uh, fiscal year 2024. Um, we've got uh, two items that are starred there. The um, Fine Creek uh, additional bathrooms and the ADA improvements. Um, those are both being subsidized currently uh, by grant funding. Um, so with the grant money that's available, that allots another 750000 of budgeted um, funding in the CIP to allocate towards um, another, another place. Um, and we've kind of targeted the Pine Creek uh, Park Phase 3 expansion. Um, <clears throat> You can see we are recommending that in fiscal year 25, um, the to move forward with the expansion of phase three of Fighting Creek Park. Um, that target number is 8.2 million. Um, we've also included the. <laughs> Let's see. Now you don't. I just need my glasses. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've got some ongoing um, equipment improvement costs for furniture and fixtures and other equipment. Um, in fiscal year 2026, um, we have a proposed uh, land expansion at Fighting Creek Park, um, and then the Turner Sports Complex parking expansion. Um, also in uh, fiscal year 2026. Um, got some other things projected out of We're looking at a 10 year CIP now. So got some things, you know, future dates that are out there. Um, let's see. But the, yeah, the Fighting Creek Park expansion, um, that's the, the big one for 2025 that we are proposing. If you can move on to the next slide. Um, 
this is the breakdown of the cost for the Fighting Creek Park expansion. Um, a lot of these numbers were taken from current other current CIP projects to come up with the estimated budget. Um, so you can see the phase two portion, um, the future parking areas from phase two, that still has not been completed. So there's a we've allocated money there for that completion. Um, got uh, you know assessing the site balance, stormwater analysis, uh, the man road extension, site lighting, architectural engineering cost, and then actual construction costs. That's what we got to our 8.2 million. Um, move on to the next slide. Um, talking more about a community center. Um, this is showing um, some of the others in neighboring or nearby counties and some of the ones that we looked at uh, with the with the uh, other committee about um, what's the size, what's the cost of the community center, trying to get some idea of what that may be. Um, in Colonial Heights has a a small small forty three hundred square foot. They got a fitness room, an office, a pocket library, multi purpose room, kitchen, and a dining area. Um, Chesterfield, uh, they have three or four that are basically the same footprint. Um, you know, being a county like that, uh, they recycle the architecture, which is, uh, yeah, they're able to do that when having multiple facilities around. But that facility um, is about 5,000 square feet. Um, it's got a kitchen, arts and crafts room, fitness room, conference room, and multi purpose room. Um, some of the larger ones, uh, Goochland, um, they have a gymnasium, um, large multi-purpose room and a kitchen. That one's 14,000 square foot. Hanover um, being one of the larger ones that was looked at um, was, uh, yeah, I have a gymnasium again, a branch library attached to it, classrooms, meeting rooms, and a stage for performing arts. That one's 20,000 square foot. Um, looking at the, from the needs assessment and the type of, um, Things that were identified from that in the, in the <clears throat> excuse me, the type of programs that um, were highlighted that uh, from the needs assessment that needed, you know, that we felt that would uh, need to be provided for. Uh, we were looking kind of at the Chesterfield one as a model, the 5,000 square foot, and then kind of with its uh, features and programming there, it kind of fits all the hits all the buttons of the items that were listed in our needs assessment. That's again, it's a 5,000 square foot facility and it's estimated cost was, you know, between 1.3 and 1.6 million. Um, <clears throat> um, go on to the next slide. So um, our request for the community center, um, there is money currently I believe there's 500,000 currently in the CIP for a community center. Our request is that uh, get authorization for a feasibility uh, or programming study of a community center uh, to include the estimating, estimating construction costs, maintenance costs, staffing needs, uh, demand analysis, and recommended size. So our ask um, from the community center standpoint is that of that 500,000, we get money allocated to provide that programming study to um, hire an architect um, to put together a team to do that programming, come up with what the footprint, what the size, um, what the needs are. Um, and from that, then you could start um, looking at site selection. As well. um, <clears throat> we wanted to, again, we want to focus that feasibility study on site options within the end. Once we get the site selection, I apologize. Once we get the site selection, um, looking within the village area um, where the building could be connected to the Fight Creek Park Trail system and near the YMCA and the schools. Um, you know, obviously the, the the town the town seat there of, of the village area um, seems to us as appropriate area. Um, again, connected with all the trails that we have. 
the other facilities of at Piney Creek Park and uh, the YMCA. Um, that concludes our presentation. Um, we're certainly open for any questions. Um, you know, do want this to be conversational. Um, if the board's <laughs> if the board desires, um, you know, this is something that we have heard a lot about from the community. Um, we, yeah, this has been one of our main focuses um, is looking into this as an opportunity. Um, to, you know, again, it was brought and highlighted by the you know by the fifty five plus um, community, but I think that it provides a lot of other opportunities, um, not just for that demographic, but throughout yeah, the Palatine citizenry to yeah have meeting rooms. Um, Fitness space, you know, youth culinary classes. The list goes on and on. Um, so it's not it's not just a 55 plus facility, but a community center that could house and operate, you know, space for that group also. Questions, comments. Yeah, quite a few. Go ahead. Comments. Um, one thing I thought was kind of interesting. Um, if you go back to your study that showed kind of the high priority, medium, low priority, it was interesting because pickleball lessons in clinics was low, but that seems to be one of the high priority. It just kind of it was interesting how that's morphed into one of the high priorities. And the other thing was that I don't really see baseball fields, et cetera, as much of a high priority. So my question to you is, you know, you guys have eight point to, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. yeah, a million towards kind of expanding Fighting Creek Park. Right. Could perhaps, and certainly, I'm not sure Megan and Will could attest to this as well, could we perhaps mm -hmm. use some of those funds towards the community center? I, I, how much is the need for more baseball fields? Mm -hmm. You know, can we spread the love, basically, sure. is, is where I'm going, instead of, right. and then, so that was one thing. And then the second thing is, have you guys looked at the, the Fighting Creek Park area for a potential site? I don't know if there's topographical you know, issues there. If we do have that area, it's not as ideal, certainly, right. for a site, but behind the landmark center. So that was just another thing. I don't know if you guys have explored that. So that was kind of my comment. Sure. On that. Um, so to address the first question, um, we did discuss, you know, the, the picture we showed showed two baseball fields. Right. Um, we, you know, with that ask being two years, I think there's some, um, we're collecting, Megan is doing a great job collecting data on the number of uh, uses of the existing baseball fields, of the existing rectangular fields, um, not just at Fighting Creek Park, but also at the admin field. And other rectangular fields are are uh, are being used. Um, I don't know that we have gotten into the weeds of whether or not it's baseball fields or rectangular space. Um, there had been traditionally a big need for lighted rectangular field space. Um, part of that vision also is in the the land expansion um, to the west of the existing soccer fields. Um, is where we had kind of envisioned previously additional rectangular field space. But that doesn't mean additional rectangular field space couldn't be on the southern end and baseball you know, or softball, yeah, you know, to the west. That that piece of it hasn't been, you know, we're not into the design, none of that has happened yet. So I think the numbers will tell us what that space may need to be. Um, so that's one thing as commission, we've asked Megan to start being able to report, and she's been doing a great job of collecting all that data so that once we get to that point, we can, you know, there can be some decisions made on what that space, you know, is, yeah, what it looks like. Um, as far as the, the second question, we haven't really looked at, we, we've done nothing as far as site selection, um, not really knowing what the desires of the board were. As far as size, programming, any of those kind of things with the community center of where it could go. Now, certainly, Fight Creek Park, I think, would be 
one of the first places that would get looked at. Uh, but we have not done anything as far as site selection. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Yes, Mr. Um, I'm confused. Okay. Or okay. here. No, no. <laughs> That's why we'll have a discussion. Uh, if I listen to you, you have uh, decided that uh, there is a need for community center. We're going to build. That's what just says. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you've said the needs is defined. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and but all of your survey said trails, 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 by car, anything else. And we have in our CIT a $450,000 uh, master trail plan. Yep. Okay, so why? And then that's going to require some money after that. The plan is not going to be, you've got it fixed. We know that. Okay. So why are you switching <clears throat> from what the community told you, which is we want more trails, and we've got it teed up to give you the information you need to something totally different, which quite frankly has not been discussed very well. Now, it started off as a senior center, then it got repurposed because that didn't get much traction um, to a community center. Mm -hmm. But the community center discussion that you just gave us focuses only on the over 55 population, not anything else that it would be used for. So it's not a community center, it's just renaming senior center. That's what it sounds like. Okay, uh, so there, there's that. So we'll, we'll come back and really would like to find out why you pivoted away from trails, okay? To put something else in front of us and say this is important, which costs more money, right. okay? Mm -hmm. uh, but as I get ready to enter uh, the fourth quartile of my life, which will happen in July, uh, the Definition of senior at 55 seems laughable. Yeah, it really is. I mean, it just, okay, I realize there are some statistics that are based on it. Uh, but really, it is more geared toward 65, okay, which takes your percentage of the population down significantly. Mm -hmm. Okay, by 33, they become 27% of the population of now. So, there's that. The other thing that I look at when you talk about your activities that you're planning, they don't sound very rural. Ceramics, art, nothing wrong with those things. But I don't see anything in there uh, that uh, would lend me to believe that you're using Mr. Flanagan's talent. He knows how to plant things. He knows how to grow things. Uh, that's, okay. <clears throat> From my standpoint, we move out here to rural Powhatan County, not to duplicate what you can get in Chesterfield, and now Han Hanover, and Rico. You're here to get something different, and you're here to give up services, not to accumulate. That's, that's part, part of living in a rural world. Okay. Uh, and so every door I knock on, and I'll be knocking on many more, says, I don't want to be like Chesterfield. And I understand that you have a committee that you have met with. I don't know who they really are. Uh, the Senior Action Committee, they're not a rural committee. We've never appointed them. I've never seen any minutes of any of their meetings. Uh, they sound like activist citizens, which is a great thing. Sure. We need them. Uh, but in my world and the people that I talk to, there's zero interest in the same thing. Time and time again. That's not where I want my money spent. <clears throat> so let's go back to uh, why switch, why move from the trailers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then you said if we're, if we're going to build this, we need to get close to the trails. Okay. That's true. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So why move away from this? Area? Why not keep your focus on something that uh, has great appeal to this community? needs a lot of help in work to take it to where it needs to be. Why move away from that to something that's totally new and, and quite frankly, uh, hasn't been supported by any data that I've seen? Well, a couple of thoughts there. I think um, the, the trails is a single item. 
the community center covers a lot more items that were highlighted in the needs assessment. 55 plus being one of them, but plenty of, and again, the list the the, the few four pictures that we had up there, by no means an exhaustive list. There are many other programs that can be offered in a space like that, that cover kids from kids to, you know, aging active adults and everybody in between. Um, so I think our, the shift was to be able to capture and offer more things that were identified in the needs assessment as opposed to one. You speak of the needs assessment. Is there anything in writing? Other, other than this, you speak of the seat needs assessment for, for the communities. Other than one page, is, do you have, is, is, is there a report? Yes. Not, 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 not of the, not the, of the needs direct, assessment for the community center. You keep speaking of the, the, uh, the, the <clears throat> we have, I mean, we, we've discussed it a lot. We have, um, you know, had a lot of discussions, a lot of conversations about it. Um, but I haven't seen any of it. No, because we, we are asking for money that's already in the CF, that's already been budgeted. We're asking to be able to be authorized to use some of that money to take it to the next step, to do a deeper dive into a study of what a community center would look like in Powhatan, of the different space that would be there to offer different programs. You're still shifting away the trails. Yeah, not, not, shifting, not, not necessarily not shifting away, but evolving and growing our actual inventory of offerings. Just trails doesn't cut it, right? We see in the needs assessment, a multitude of needs from the community, across the community, and a community center can fill a large cross-section of those for the entire gamut of age demographics in the county. It's not just senior focused, it's not youth focused, But in fact, uh, trails for what the constituency of this county says they want. That's one of the items that they said. The items is list. by far. If you look at the percentages, by far what they said they want. Where is that? I, I see that's that's a priority, and I don't see trails listed anywhere. Page 38. I think it's mutually exclusive that facilities that are most important to the house. This is one of the children. Okay. 45%. Excuse me, it's 60. We've got two numbers. I'm sorry, it's 62 on one corner and 38 in the other. How about the right corner? Is it right corner 38? 38 is the middle. Go with the big number. 62 is a small number. Okay. Okay. Facilities that are most important to households by far. You look at it. Walking and biking trails, 45% of the community wants that. Uh, community center is down at 8%. Look at the next page on 39. You have fitness and wellness programs at 40%. What are which walking and biking trails are part of it? As well as, as, well as, as, well as classes. And as well. Walking in a trail. I mean, if you want the yes. active adults and they're. 80 years old and you want to do a Tai Chi class, you're not doing it on a trail. I mean, that's I'm, the whole point I'm, of a I'm, I'm, I'm almost 76 and I walk every day on the trails on my farm. So, you know, that's the it's exercise. you. Yes. That, that's not, because you do that doesn't mean the rest of the community doesn't want, you know, a sense of, you know, you, you say about, um, you know, we live in a rural community. Because you live in a rural community it doesn't mean you want to feel any sense of community. In fact, I think it's more important when you live in a rural community. You're not in a lot of citizens aren't in neighborhood where they can go and you know talk to their neighbor. I mean, you have social isolation, depression. I think a community center could alleviate, you know, I mean, how many we've been on this board now three and a half years. How many citizens have we had come down at the public meeting and say they want a walking trail? How many have we had come down and say they want a community center? At least that's what I've seen. I mean, you know, so I, I think just at least let it explore the option. 
No, well, you want to spend money, okay? Quite frankly, and we'll get into this later on, we don't have the money to do your $8 million expansion to set something. The CIP won't handle it, much less more money. Well, that's reality. I moved to conservative rural power town not to look for governors to be the answer to my needs, period. Okay? Not to have the government surround me uh, with things that I can get on my own. And that includes churches. <clears throat> that includes institutions that are already here. Cameron, you mentioned the Y, yeah. uh, which is a perfect example. Uh, and so now we're starting down a path of, wow, let's find a way to spend some more money. Uh, but where is the uh, BCU, Department of Gerontology, a senior connection study that's really going to do a real look at needs in this county, and then we're going to do it for free? I have not seen that study yet. Oh. And, uh, I, don't know. Yeah, so, I mean, I don't think it's been finished yet, but that's where you start. Okay, with information you don't have to buy. So, uh, I, you know, we had a senior center morphed into a different name, looking for a reason to be. And I keep trying to find a reason for it to be, and I haven't, I haven't seen it yet. I've heard people talking about it, but I've never seen anybody do anything like this. Today. And quite frankly, uh, given the condition of our CIP, I'm not interested in committing uh, any more money into any more projects when we can't afford the projects we have on the shelf today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir, Mr. Cox. Yes, sir, Mr. Williams. You go to page 36 in the packet. Page of the Cox's reference. Salt is that respondent households have a need for. I'll, I'll read it just a few of them from the beginning. Of, uh, walking and biking. Uh, this is the second one here, open spaces, swimming, boating, access to boating, fishing. But you have to go some ways to get to community center. I think that's down on the list towards the middle. I go over to page 37, next page. Estimated number of households with needs. Parks, follow slash facilities are being met 50% or less. Again. You go to the top, it says walking and biking trails, shooting ranges. It doesn't say indoor archery ranges, it says shooting ranges, swimming pools, water parks, etc., adventure areas, boating and fishing again. But anyway, you have to go down to number 11 to community center. That brings up a question. Why, if the community concern would encapsulate all of these other things, how many you're saying would be under community center? Why did the community list community center separate as well as these other things? They're different entities in the survey. Um, go to the next page, page 38. Facilities most important to households. Again, look at the very top. Walking and biking trails. So what I'm seeing in the assessment, we're on track in terms of the prioritization that was set forth, you know, with looking at expanding the walking, biking trails in the county. Plan that we're proposing to do. I'm going to go back and ask, ask some questions about these community centers that you visited in the other counties or this committee. And I don't know who speaks for the over 55 community in this county. As Mr. Cox said, we haven't appointed any committee. You're the committee. Okay. I don't know about senior action committee. You're going to have to explain to me who they are. 
Okay. But I'm looking for you as a source of information. So when we go to the places, you know, we mentioned Chesterfield County, are those other community centers, any of them, you know, like when we say over in Stonehenge, is that county or is that community? Some, some, uh, can, some of them are uh, county facilities, some of them are private, as you're correct. <clears throat> okay. Because I know when I was growing up, you know, when you, you know, had a development come in, a lot of times they would do a community center in conjunction with it. That's the reason I asked and I knew, I knew about one community, Stonehenge. Right. So these were other community subdivisions, if you will. So the ones that are listed on our actual slideshow are county, county. run, parks and rec, operated community centers. So every, every, yeah, so Larger. the ones that did the county take them over these community centers? They built them, they purpose built them. So did, or is the county staffing them? Did, yes. Did it yes. still belong to the community? No, the, the, the county, county staffs them, the, the county owns them, and they operate them, and set programming inside of them. I think, Mr. Williams, there are, there are still privately owned community centers within developments. They're not, not everything the ones that we listed were county owned and operated facilities. And I think the ones the one like maybe in Stonehenge, Walton Park comes to mind, where I grew up. Yeah. Again, <laughs> what I know. Uh, those are still owned by the community as a rentable space that can be used by members of that yeah, pool, recreation facility, homeowners association, whatever it may be that owns and operates those privately, private ones, the ones that we listed or ones that are owned and operated by the county and their parcel rec department. And to that point, the second thing on the list here for that are most important to household, you see swimming pools and water parks and stuff like that. Those are the kind of uh, developer amenities that developers put into their communities, their planned communities, to entice people to choose their development over another de development. I think of Magnolia Green off the top of my head. They've got a humongous water park out there. The developer put that in because they knew it was desirable to their their potential customers right they've got to sell lots uh, and there are a lot of lots to be sold uh we in in Powhatan county we don't the only public pool that is truly publicly available is the ymca everything else is some form of a private type pool so you got the you know i belong to oakwood it's a private pool i pay a membership fee uh, it's a smaller pool, but it, it has community style features. We have a uh, picnic grounds, we have basketball, we have tennis out there, but that's part of the actual facility itself. Uh, and I think that's why it comes up on the need study is so high and desirable to households because it's not readily available. I, I was personally, when, when they did the need study, I was shocked um, to see walking trails and then it clicked. I'm, I moved out to a rural area. If I want to walk, I go like Mr. Cox just said, I go for a walk in my yard. Right? Well, not everybody has a big yard, um, especially it, here in the village, right? You just look out front, you'll see 20 people walk past this building in the next 10 minutes. They walk the trails that are available to them because that's what they have available to them. And I'm <laughs> glad that we're expanding that trail network, uh, but we can't just, we can't have blinders on and focus on one thing. You can see the list of needs is, is large, so. And we've got a finite pile of money too. Exactly. So we're trying to okay, get so the biggest. What we're trying to do is trying to be, you know, proactive in a responsible manner, keeping in mind that we don't have that infinite pot of money. We do want to listen to the community. There's a lot of information in here in this assessment. I remember when it was done. So do I. There was a lot of interest. When they first sent out the surveys, a lot of people that didn't get the surveys that were to be included in the uh, results, those people contacted people doing the survey and said, we want to be included. So they sent out additional packages. And then, we had, online yeah, and then we went online. Yeah. And then it came into question with you know the different sports groups, you know, being proactive. With them weighing in online, what did that do to dilute, you know, the validity of the statistically valid you know, survey that was done? Because now you're bringing in another 
not controlled population that's being mixed with the population that was supposed to be just statistically sampling what was going to be the community's drugs. So we went through that. And when we did that and when we, we got the report from it, we did break those results out separately from the online survey to the statistically valid survey. And they were pretty close in line within a few percentage points. And the items were a little bit different, but uh, outside groups weren't, or very focused groups, your athletic groups and so on and so forth, were not able to weigh this weigh the statistically valid study well, let's, in let's any way on the shelf for right now. I'm going to go back to Mrs. Carmack's question, which was a good question. You know, if we're going forward with another phase of Pine Creek Park, and we're looking at the utility of the ball fields, mm -hmm. and whether or not we got, that will be sufficient. I would think that we should have the data already today that addresses how much these fields are being used for what purpose. To me, I, I don't see how you have a parks and rec program not having that information. Do you have that information? I don't think you do. We do have some we usage. Have, yeah. We have started, we have started, so to, so we have started to gather. Okay, you're starting to gather, but yeah. it's very important. If we're going to plan, one of the things I'm going to demand that we all know is okay what is the usage of the fields today and what is the projection use of the fields going forward i don't know how you can plan a little phase of park and that's and that agree. is something that we have been asked our committee have our commission has been asking for from you know, previous you know folks who ran the parks and rec rudimentary numbers at best since well, megan has come on board we've made it a priority and she's you know taken that as a priority to gather those usage numbers. So she is putting together monthly reports and tracking those numbers of everything, not just the sports, not just the outdoor sports spaces, but the gym, the classroom, all the other things that the Parks and Rec Department now operates. So we're gathering that information so that we can decide back to Ms. Carmack's you know, question, um, what does that expansion look like? Is it baseball fields, softball fields, is it rectangular space? Yeah, if those if those numbers, yeah, what those numbers show. We've also asked uh, Megan uh, to share that with the board on a monthly basis, so you as a board member can see what the participations are if you're in the park. I've even asked for a traffic counter to put in the park, but I'd like to know how many people are utilizing the park past the National Guard building. Or past the YMCA. Yeah, because, we should know. Yeah, we should. Because the only way we can tell is how much the park has been used as having numbers. And that's one thing that we are, we will uh, give Megan and her staff kudos is that she has been very vividly uh, working on this, trying to get the data to us so that you, we can share. She's done a real good job in the last three months. Uh, we have that information. And also the rental the fees, the amount of money she's bringing in the rental fees. So um, going back to what you talked about earlier, in your request is to authorize a feasibility study. Powhatan County Community Center can include estimated construction cost, maintenance cost, staffing cost, demand analysis listed last. How do you do the other three, other three things before you understand the need and the demand for that need? How do you go out there and do those things? I don't know how you do it. You have to first know what the need is, what the demand is, and then you can determine what type of requirements you have for the building for its function. I don't know that they were listed at any priority. <laughs> um, uh, and I, I added the programming, you know, feasibility slash programming to one, you know, if, if we were authorized and hired an architect to do this programming piece, there would be, you know, through that process of community meetings and discussions with different demographic groups, what the needs, what would that space look like? What are the things that would have to be housed in it? So that then you could come up with 
you know, rough footprints to get the cost, the staffing needs. Of the so again, I don't think they were listed in any chronological order there. But yeah. Well, who, who are you going to go to for your needs and for you to manage? Are you going to go to the over 55 group that you're talking to? Who are you going to go that to? That would be one demographic, yes. Who, who else are you going to talk to? Um, yeah, I, I think to be it seems like it's being driven, you know, by this thing with that having a senior center, like Mr. Cox said. I would imagine we would do like we did for the needs study and work together as a commission to develop focus groups for the actual survey for the needs and the demands. The same process that Need we and did. Demands of the, of the community, the community as a whole. Well, yes, from well, every well, district, every demographic that's represented it and would be a potential user of the space. Okay, are we, thing, are we designing space? You know, are we looking at the needs to define the space? Are we having the space try to look for needs? So which, which we, have to, the we have to like? understand the needs in order to define what the space will look like. I'm having a hard time, you know, say, seeing that there's a you know, demand for a building. I don't even know what size right now. I've heard square footage anywhere from what you said, Chesterfield or prefer, we, we were kind of targeting that 5,000 square foot. That's okay. what, from the different ones that were you know, looked at, that was kind of the... Where did the indoor archery range come from? So that's that's a need in conjunction with the 4-H program and offering actual facilities that, that they would had come to us and, and spoke about. And indoor? it would be... So it wouldn't be a permanent indoor archery range. It would be a space that can facilitate an archery range on a regular basis. So they would need somewhere to store. Storage is one of the biggest problems that we have with, with PLC is dedicated storage for groups that want to use that space or use that space on a very regular basis. They don't have dedicated storage for their stuff. So people are carrying things in and out constantly. Um, and keep in mind that the majority of these programs that are leveraging those spaces are volunteer based. So any any help that we can offer them to offload some of their stuff and keep it in a permanent space. Plus it makes them feel as a welcome member of the community or a group of the community. And it goes back to building that actual community uh, involvement and feeling. Are they going to shoot indoors or shoot outdoors? Where do they shoot It's happen? indoor archery. They would shoot indoors. Indoor? Yes, sir. The indoor ranges I'm, I'm familiar with, they're not portable. They do it at the schools, so they have to be portable in some way, shape, or form. Yeah, because if this is four H. If you put the target down range, <laughs> I, I'm just <laughs> telling you from my personal experience. Well, I so, think yeah, so in, in, that, in, that that in that particular instance, I think that's where the storage came into play. Was you know you can move them out onto the floor or wherever, but you can't throw them in the back of the hatchback, and yeah. take them home. With you. So, um, so I think storage was was key. Um, one thing I wanted to point out, um, if you, I know we we talked about the pages 36 through 38 in the needs assessment, that was looking at the facilities. If we go looking at 39 through 41, is where the programs are listed, and the number one program listed throughout, uh, except with the exception of on 40, um, but. Uh, Fitness and wellness programs was at the top. Um, community special events was towards the top on on those program needs. Um, again, programs for and services for adults 55 plus was high on those priority lists. So again, I think although the facility the facility need was identified lower on the charts as a community center. Of the programs that were being requested as needs reflect a community center space to offer said programs. So that's part of that. So you're shift. saying you're saying uh, fitness and wellness is directly related to having space in a community center. That would definitely be one area that we would want to provide in a community center would be a a dance room or you know some type of aerobic space where classes could be held um you know something you know other than you know, again yes going out and walking on the trails or walking around the farm i love to do it i do it as often as i can but 
that's not for everyone. Some people want a class facility where they can go and yeah, do a cycling class or whatever they do. I don't know. Yeah, go to go yoga or, or you know. So for instance, at the YMCA, they they play bridge, right? On Wednesdays, they use the little aerobic room there. They play bridge. If you want to learn how to play bridge, you can go to the the YMCA. That's a wellness and and type of program. Um, I heard him, uh, Mr. Connolly, mention. Uh, Go mahjong, right? It's for your mind. It's a hard game. My wife plays it. She's really good at it. I I can't get my my brain wrapped around it. What's that? Monopoly. <laughs> that, we've been, the we've, rent, rent always got in the way. <laughs> but um, that's the the type of offerings that we would be able to to have um, a tech center of some sort, technology center. Come in and, and take a Microsoft Word class, right? Learn how to do it. Uh, if you've never done it before, or uh, continuing education for uh, young adults right after school, CPR classes, right? We, we house those out of the, the fire stations right now, but I'm sure we could use more facilities or more availability to, to do that. Those are the type of wellness programs, uh, general nutrition and education, but we don't have a space for that right now. Do you know how many people would show up if you did? I know right now our spaces are booked 100 percent that's what i know our spaces for wellness and fitness i know the one conference room slash community room at the powhatan landmark center is booked and stays booked the okay, gym well, has I've been got, booked i've got something here that mr Hager, Hager gave me will gave me i asked him for a printout of the different classes that were being held at the landmark by type of class and the attendance by date. One three. I guess that's the beginning of this year. Technology education participants three. One four. Food creativity participants ten. One five. Social games four people. Uh, Movers and pacers, I'm not sure what that is, is 14. Technology education, again, is three. Um, potluck, food always brings people in, 27. Social games, eight. Uh, but that goes the whole list. Uh, pretty much. You get numbers, you know, like 10 people. Uh, you got one here for the law program, which attracted 22 people. And then you'll get, again, financial programming for, uh, again- May I ask a follow-up question to this? Uh, who's who's providing these, these services, right? So- Will, would you like to answer that question? Like who's sponsoring these and, and setting this stuff up? The community managed program. Okay, so that's a singular program with a singular outreach group. So if we want to talk numbers, we can take data and we can skew it to any story that we want to tell, right? I'm not skewing any numbers. I'm giving you the numbers of You're not giving the numbers. whole picture. The number does not give the whole picture. That's a single group that has a single space that is outreaching to a certain amount of community members. Okay, well, let's go lead to my next question. What programming are we doing under recreation? This is underneath social services. So I've always wondered why isn't this being done? We had a conversation last meeting some months ago about what we were going to be providing for older adults under the department, or excuse me, under parks and recreation. In my opinion, I'm in agreement with you. This should be under parks and rec. Why is Community Matters doing this? Why isn't Parks and Rec doing this? And why is Social Services doing this instead of us? Those I'd say it's probably, due, it's probably due to staffing because the staff that Parks and Rec currently has has a full plate and already handling the gym space and the field space that's available. So with the current inventory of actual locations that they have and the staff that they have, they've got folks working constantly and please correct me if i'm wrong megan but i do believe staffing is the primary issue that you are forced to partner with community groups to offer these services correct 
the only way we can succeed as a small department as we are right now is by partnering with other groups. The events that we have done in just the last few months, because there was an ask for community events, we partnered with the library, we partnered with the YMCA, with our staff combined, we could offer a great event. Uh, in order to, the community wants senior recreation programming. In order to offer senior recreation programs, we've partnered with Community Matters. That group is coming in. We have a partnership in OU to use the facility and they can offer senior recreation programs. We partner with all, we, we have not run sports, sports leagues out of Parks and Recreation. We have partnered with every, every sports group, uh, every program we offer has been a partnership program. And that's how a small parks and recreation department survives. Mr. Chairman, real quick, all, community all, matters all, was all, created all, by all, social Mr. Services. Williams has the floor. That's why. Okay. So all, I, would, Mr. Williams has the floor. I would like to say, if you go to other localities and other municipalities, you will notice that they do the same thing. They have to partner with their community that's members that's to offer program. That's, that's the question, because we're in budget seats. Okay. One of the things we've talked about mm -hmm. is Programming now, you know, I'm not. A, I'm glad you are partnering because that was going to be my next question. What are, what are we doing in terms of actual partnering? You know, with folks like the YMCA, mm -hmm. Senior Connections, etc. Because your programming doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have a building. Okay. Well, I agree. Yeah, agree. we we offer plenty of programming today that don't. That does not require a building. And since we have acquired a building in the inventory with the repurposing of the landmark center and the gymnasium, that has opened us up to new programming and exploring new opportunities in so partnership with if, our community. If we, if we need more staff to be able to provide programming of wherever it occurs, again, I'm not a, a person that says you're going to build a building to have programming, but if I need more staff, now's the time because we're in budget season. You know, that was why we asked for requests from the departments. Tell us what your needs are. Tell us what you're going to do. Because one of the things we've talked about in this county for years is about having programming where we generate revenues for the county. I can't tell you why it hasn't happened, but we talk about it every year. Mrs. Carmack has brought it up every year about why don't we have program 1099 programs like other counties? What are we doing to bring in revenue? And let's go back to this thing about YMCA charges. One of the things that's mentioned in this study is about one of the ways that you pay for things like a senior center is by a CIP charge on top of a charge for any type of services that you're providing. Are you planning on providing all services? <laughs> are you providing, are you saying that you're going to charge for certain services, you know, like adult education does? Certain services would come with fees to cover cost of materials, right? So if we're doing a culinary class, do we expect the county to foot the bill for all of the food? No, but do we expect them to provide the actual facilities and potentially- But to take the class, for example- that's Yeah, you would have a flat fee, right? Yeah, so, yeah, so you would have would be, a yeah, flat yeah, fee. I would envision a fee to cover the materials and if it's an outside person coming to teach the class, their rates. But the space that would be used would be a community-owned space that wouldn't necessarily have an additional fee tack on top of that. So if we had like an art gallery space, right? You're paying for your painting <clears throat> materials, the canvas and the instructor time, you're gonna have a fee associated with that. But since the facility itself is subsidized by the county and provided by the county, that fee's much lower than if I were to go to a, a paint night with my friends where it's, you know, 50 bucks a head, I can pull it off of the county's help for a much lower cost, thus raising particip participation rate. And while we're on the subject, I'm sorry. Wait, no. I was going to. I was going to say one thing that um, Megan has been working on that you know, we had asked for was updating our fee schedules for the space that we do have. Yes. Um, she's put a lot of work into that. We had a long discussion um, last week, and again, I think it it comes back to direction from the board of are of how how what what some of this cost recovery looks like 
if it's a fee-based model or if it's, you know, facilities are free for community uh, citizens. Yeah, again, for the classes, I, I would envision, you know, some cost to cover materials and teacher costs, but what's the facility fee look like? And I think that's where, you know, in the development of that cost recovery and fee policy, you know, we'd be looking to the board for some direction of what type of model the board wants to see, because I know there's been a lot of discussions recently over, you know, some of the field space usage and affiliated programs, who is, who isn't, all this stuff. Um, and through that, that was that discussion we had, you know, looking for some direction from the board of what type of model we want to build around. Yeah, so take, for instance, like Pulse Basketball, they're an affiliated recreation program with the county, yet they still pay a usage fee to use the Powhatan Landmark Center for their their needs because it's a service that's offered by the county. They're, it has to be staffed, it has to be cleaned, it has to be uh, heated and cooled and lighted, and they understand that. So they and ultimately they have to pass that cost on to the actual consumer of their product, but they're willing to do that and they understand that model. and the citizens that are using Pulse Basketball for that recreational service understand, hey, we're in a county facility. It's a really nice facility. Everything in there is brand new. It's going to cost a little more money, but at least I'm here. I'm home. I'm local. I don't have to travel to Chesterfield County so my kid can practice basketball, you know, and they're appreciative of it. The facility is nice. The conversation has been going back to when Fighting Creek came into being as we could have something special in Powhatan County and would actually ge generate revenue. People will tell you we have some of the best fields, if not the best, in the region. We've never made money. And the reason we let people come in, hold tournaments, and they would leave with a bag full of money at the end of the weekend, we'd only charge them to cover, you know, for the maintenance of the fields. I don't know whether that's still going. But going back to you, Cameron, when you said, you know, you're looking for guidance from the board, I'm going to tell you, the reason y'all were appointed was to give us guidance. Okay, you were to give us information for our decision making. That's what we're looking for you to do. If you're talking about different options, you know, for revenue and, and how you structure that, Give us the option. <laughs> Tell us what you know based on what you see out in the world today. Because I can speak as one supervisor. I don't know. That's why I'm looking to you. And again, that that is you know that that new cost cost recovery and fee model was is, is being developed. We've got a, a a new copy of it. But again, that was part of that was to address current needs. It's moving forward. I think we're going to continue to gather information to be able to come to you with those options to be able to get y'all's feedback on how, well, how some of this structure. I want to see those, those programs. I want to see, you know, your suggestions for revenue. I want to see that come to fruition because it's language now for years right. and it needs to be addressed. Um, what do you see if, if, if you build this community center? Do you think all of our needs are going to be met? Some of our needs? If so, which ones? And how do you go about assessing needs and demand for this community center? How are you going to do that? So I think we can meet a, meet a large cross section of the needs that were identified in the needs study. As far as demand, programming is going to have to evolve to meet the demand. Um, we can offer certain things up, uh, but without actually seeing true demand, it, it's hard to gauge it. Uh, the program offerings will reflect what the community wants to have available in those spaces once the space becomes available. I, I can't tell you right now what the demand's going to look like because I don't have any data to go off of. I can't compare myself to Chesterfield County because I don't have the folks. Uh, we just don't have the population. I can't compare myself to Gooch right, because we're not Goochley, yeah, right? Powhatan is uniquely Powhatan. That's why people come to Powhatan. So uh, I do believe through other 
community groups like the 4-H program and the co-op, they've offered cooking classes and other programs across the uh, across time that we could we could learn from that, obviously, and partner with them to give them potentially a larger space and facility to operate out of. This isn't just a a space for parks and recreation to operate. It is a community center for community members to operate potentially their existing programs that they can't grow the demand to because they don't have the facilities to grow it any larger than it already is. If there's some some offerings we just can't do because we don't have the space to house them. So again, what that demand looks like. It, yeah. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, like, we, don't, we don't have a baseline of what 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 the right. interest and what the response yeah. and participation will be. So if you understand my trepidation going forward and spending committing millions of dollars of taxpayers' money or you know going into the future. And then you know we've got to maintain the building, we've got to staff it. And then if we build it and they don't come, what then? Well, so that was part of our ask for the feasibility study is maybe repurposing existing facilities and in inventory with light retrofits to meet the needs instead of building a completely dedicated standalone community center. That's right. Yeah, I mean that's, so, that's certainly an option. Yes. So I didn't I didn't get yeah. that from your presentation. I understand. That's why we're having conversations yeah. so we can flesh all this I'm out. Glad, I'm glad you brought that up because how I'm, I'm, my brothers is is I don't think any of us you know are against the idea of serving the community or any different parts of the community. Okay. Uh, I just want to make sure that there is a need and that whatever we do with you know the taxpayers tax dollars that is going to be done in a responsible fashion we don't look over there and say we built that bright shiny building over there and it's not being used i and i think that we've got a good track record of repurposing facilities i mean we're sitting in one right now right so we take our current inventory and what we have available to us powhatan county doesn't rush out to build and buy new things we we build things to last and we use them and through their life. Wasn't that an old school? Yeah, that's exactly what they did. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So that facility that is in Goochland was part of the old high school complex. When they built their new high school, middle school complex, they looked at their existing inventory and said, let's repurpose it. We did that with Powhatan Landmark Center. We built the new middle school. So we've got this big old building sitting here that's got these things that we're missing. Let's repurpose it. And we got Brand new yeah. gymnasium and what I'm looking for is is there a way where we can actually gauge the need and demand, be able to say these are the services people are looking for, activities people are looking for, these are the the numbers we anticipate that would be utilizing this service or this activity. Is there any way we can get at that? So that was actually phase two of the need study that the funding was cut for. So we did have a feasibility and programming budgeted and it was it was snapped back up in CIP or operational cost, I think about four years ago, roughly. Mm -hmm. So we had originally done phase one, which was the need study and survey, and then we were going to go into programming and demand after that with pros consulting. Yeah, because I, I I really don't have anything right like we, we don't either. Well, yeah, we well, absolutely yeah. need outside consult for that it's you know yeah you know it, just as an example you know we don't have an existing facility that's got a kitchen with two stoves to say we really need one that's four I, you know that data doesn't exist because we don't have a facility well i know you know you go so, back to chesterfield you know i was just at a community meeting for bell press and bell bridge i'd say homeowners organization you know down at founders bridge they had their meeting at Salisbury Presbyterian Church. I mean, they they live in Founders Bridge, but yet they're meeting in a church over in Chesterfield. So I've, I've over the years, throughout different things that I've, I've done in the community, I've used Maine, their building at Maine right here, because it does have a full kitchen in the back, right? So I can serve food out of there. I can actually, it's a larger space. It's not humongous, but I can fit 100 folks this? in there. The um, company, company uh, Maine, yeah, company one? Uh, Rescue Squad. Oh, Rescue Rescue Squad. Yeah. Oh, so right next to it, they, they've got the. Oh, yeah, that's huge. That's a wonderful building that the community is providing, right? Yeah, it came up as a necessity. They generate revenue out of that. 
um, for renting out the space. And part of other groups have, have done it. Um, May Memorial does it. Um, how to United Methodist, they have a gym. Well, the Methodist Church right up here in the village. I yeah, mean, they, they rent that space of activities over there. And that is there because they, they've they also seen a decline in usage for sports activities because it's got basketball court in there. Yeah. Because so we have power to yeah, so I hate to bother, interrupt you. To bother you. Um, do you guys understand Mr. Williams' questions and his point? So what he's wanting to know here? Yeah. Do you guys get it? Can you provide that information? Not right now, no. Okay. No. That's part of our ask. Okay. With the allocated money, the budget is to go to that step mm -hmm. and be able to come up with more definitive right. numbers on what the actual need is and what the, the numbers that we would expect how many people to define this space. How many people, what's the population of Goochland County? So what's the size of their community center? 14,000 square feet. Mm -hmm. What type mm -hmm. of program? Let me ask you this. Do they have a successful program or do they have a mediocre average? What's the rate of their program? Anecdotally, I believe it's very successful. Say that to me again. So anecdotally, I, from what I hear is it's very successful. So they have 28,000 people population, less than Palatine County. They have a 14,000 square foot community. That was a repurposed mm -hmm. situation, mm -hmm. which what you're basically saying, I agree with you. Uh, is okay by Lady Josh? Yes. Okay. Uh, then, then I agree with you on that. You know, the county, Palatine County does a, a, a very good job at repurposing things. You know? And I, what I want to do is see if we can maybe move along here a little bit. Is there something else you want to get into, Mr. Williams? Yeah, I want to finish up what I was talking about. Okay. And I like speaking. Gotcha. Well, we, we might after, after dinner. <laughs> You're in a hurry. Well, I, I do think we do need to start yeah, well around with. I mean, no, 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 this is normal. This is very normal. These are the meetings we normally have. Continue, please. Well, I will. Uh, going back to, you know, adaptive reuse of existing buildings, what I'm looking for is matching up the need with existing resources. And then where existing resources don't exist, what can we do to augment where we have resources? And then when we can't do anything, and then it makes more sense to do something else, what is the something else? I don't want to go from A to Z. Does that make sense, guys? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. That's all I'm asking. I, I like information. So uh, to recap, you're going to give us information about the utility of ball fields, and this is Carmack's question about field utilization versus maybe having space available for a senior center or something else, you're going to get that and say you didn't have those numbers before with the former administration, but you will be getting those information, that information to us in the future. Yes. Yep. They are actually, I believe this month was the first month of uh, Megan's monthly report that started including PLC usage numbers on it, correct? Yeah. So yeah. the data is already coming in and we'll soon yeah. be able to start yeah. having the right, trending. We've asked for you know, yeah. information from, by the way, I like your idea of having a member of the board because we've started getting information from social services about what's going on in social services each month. I would like to see as one board member, similar reports, information from your committee telling us so that we don't wait right yeah like we have and I, I put that on us not you but we've asked megan to share monthly reports to the board of the administrators so y'all will see what's taking place please. in the fields and what's what else is she's doing as well yes. yeah, okay. it's been wonderful the reports that she's been giving us awesome. all, all the programming that has occurred for that month programming that's planned for the next month project work daily operation and yeah. it's big big boulder. it makes sense because again you know if we're just talking about this information at budget time it's usually too late yeah exactly it helps <laughs> you forecast yeah and I, I think to what josh was getting at um we've got from for the plc use we've got the first three months of this year we've just got this month the field usage ah, because spring sports yeah, spring you. sports just started yep. um 
this may be in your packet. I'm just going to hit a couple of highlights just from a, you know, the landmark center use. Um, January was about 1,200 total dispens. February just over 2,000. March was about 1,500. On, uh, it, it, it's a total. So in other words, if the same 10 people showed up for 100 That's meetings, 10 touches, yes. But, you know, like I said, that's why I got it broken up by session. Right, yeah. Do you, do you all have that? We do. That's an impact. Yeah. Okay. Um, for the for the field usage, um, this is all the athletic fields that the Parks and Rec controls. Uh, month of March, total participation was 28,253. Just for the month of March. That's, that's good. I, that's in the aggregate. But what I need to do is it's further got ball it's, fields, and you've got open, more people that need ball fields than you've got ball. That's fields. the next step. That's the, that's the next step. So we we've asked Megan to, and she's been working on it, and getting us that information of hours usage, usage hours, rest hours, in order to keep a healthy inventory of field space. You've got to rotate them, or we're yeah, drown, so we're drowning that. in maintenance cost at that point. Right, and operational costs cost start to balloon to try to keep a field. So, if we can't meet the demand today, what yeah. does the demand look like going forward, and what do we need to do with the space for the next phase of the park? Exactly. That's right. And I, I believe we have discussed, and I think this was maybe shown through some of Megan's numbers, that this is the first spring since pre COVID where the, you know, we're back to pre COVID numbers. Yeah, the, the youth spring. participation and adult participation outdoor. Recreational wise, it's, it's back to its pre COVID numbers now. They were down probably in the neighborhood of 25% to 30% over the last couple of years, but everybody's back to normal again, thankfully. So, okay. and I know um, a lot of the programs that I'm personally involved in, they've been reporting record numbers for the last, you know, of, of restorations, and they're ecstatic to the point that they're like, I, I don't know. How we're even going to stat all this up volunteer wise. So it's a good problem to have. Thank you. Anyone else have any comments or questions? Yeah. Yes, sir. That'll be short. I appreciate what y'all do. Both y'all were set a task and you did it. You, you set your top priority needs. This chart here on the 36, 37, done in 2019 before COVID. Okay. Things have changed since COVID. The oh, the a senior so they keep saying a community center is needed in this county. That's what I've talked to my I've talked to my constituents along with everybody else I know in this county. They want a community center. I've coached Josh. I've coached here for 18 years: softball, baseball, soccer. The fields were Crowded and book solid when I coached. And that was a long time ago. So I don't know, if anybody rides around Palatine, you can go out there right now. Every field appears packed. You can't get a, a spot to get a picnic shelter, to have a picnic, because everything is rented, booked, solid. Am I correct, man? Correct. Correct. We are far behind as for the needs of Palatine County and the people that desperately need it. And it's not just the seniors, it's not just the young people. It starts very young and goes all the way up. And a community center would help all that. But as far as the, the fields and the needs of Powhatan County, we are in desperate need of it. So, and what y'all's biggest need, y'all keep getting these questions, but you also say you, your biggest, what you want is a feasibility, you want to study done before you can start anything. The five hundred thousand dollars has already been allocated for that. We voted on that, so I'm in favor. Of y'all start the study. That's me. That's the rest of the board. Because I've been in this county my whole life, and I know the needs of this county. That's it. And I, I will say that the feasibility and needs study would be a continuation with pros, and they've already got the base work done. Um, so. The, the consulting firm that we worked with, they were fantastic. They um, they came out, they walked us through every step of this and, and really did bring a lot of value add to the table and gave us hard data numbers to start working off of. You don't have to tell me, I have 20 some people come this week with the trouble with the fields, not being able to get over the field. They're books out. 
I don't know. So. Thank y'all. What y'all do? It's good work. Only about 45 minutes. Okay. Um, I like what Mr. King said. And the thing that he and I have in common on that war memorial field over there, when I was eight years old, I played baseball. I've lived in this country. And I didn't grow up in Chesterfield. I didn't grow up in Richmond. And I didn't see all of those things. I see power. And I may be classified as a spender. If that's what I'm going to be classified as. I'm going to be a proud spender. So I'm proud to live in this county. I've always been proud to live in this county. There were some men at that time that didn't have any idea how their baseball program was going to work. But they knew there were some kids that wanted to play. And they knew that they needed to give these kids an opportunity to learn how to be teammates, to learn how to win, to learn how to lose, to learn how to play together as a team. And they took the risk and they did it. And today, or at least the last time I was involved in it, it was PYAA. And I was, at one time, it was 1996, I was the baseball commissioner for PYAA. And I asked Megan, by the way, Megan and Zach Staten, yes, thank you for coming on the, with the group of Parks and Rec. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. Glad, glad to have you here. Appreciate it. But I asked Megan some information the other day, and she's been very quick to respond, and she's been pretty accurate with her information on how many people were playing baseball. The numbers are pretty much the same. I agree with Mr. Williams. You know, this is a, a, a department that should make some money and be able to not be self-sufficient with it, but there is a number that it should bring in to offset the expense to the taxpayers. What that number is, I don't know. Um, I know with this study, I was at the meeting when that man was talking to you guys about it, it a $10 million bill that was there. That was in 2019 that I came to your meeting. I think that that's a lot of money. I don't know about the 8.2 and how we get there. We don't get there, but we have CIP, a 10-year CIP. We've been working on that. We, we, we adjust and adapt it every year. Um, and if we plan appropriately, which I think we did, the money's there. The money was initially set up at $6.2 million, if my memory's right, and it was to be borrowed. And in the four years, almost four years I've been on this board, um, we haven't borrowed anything near that. So if you need to borrow it to do something constructive for this county, then you need to borrow it. Um, if you are really interested, take a Saturday and drive to Flagging Creek Park. If you're really interested, and you really want to know what's going on. I knew Charlie Green really well. I know Mr. Williams worked with him, I think, uh, on the board. Um, that was a great park and it was a great idea by, by, by uh, Charlie. And as Mr. Williams said, it is an elite park, uh, park. And I've been up there in the past three years, many times. And the people that come to that park, when you have softball tournaments, talk about this is the nicest place they played ball in all summer. This is the nicest facility they've been at in two years. This is the most beautiful park anywhere they've been. And these people come from all over the Commonwealth of Virginia. And they pay $500 for a team to come and play. The person who heads up the tournament, 60 teams, $500, he's making pretty good. We charge them. $75 to use the field for a day? Close? 100 Well, Charles, 100 You were talking earlier about these youth groups and, and you know, community matters and, and people that pay, groups that pay. Pulse Basketball, I think, is who you mentioned, Josh. Um, they pay to use the facility, right? Right or wrong? Yes. Right. Right. Okay. Yes. So the baseball fields that are here, 
Do that, does that group, which would be Powhatan Little League, do they pay to use the baseball diamonds? No. No. Okay. Yeah. They're what? They're They're citizens. Citizens. They're well, what does these people play in false basketball? So there's additional costs that go into staffing the building it, itself, right? So they don't, well, now since Megan's taken over, they do have the rover available. They have some some more creature comforts yeah. for that. And I think, you know, with the level of service comes uh, a higher level of service comes potential higher fees to use the facility. I, I'm not arguing right? really the point. I, I agree with you. But yeah, that. there is a difference with if you're using uh, Palatine Landmark Center because it is heated, cooled, staffed, clean. Um, it's a higher cost, and we're trying to recoup, yeah. offset some of those costs. I, I, and you should. Mm -hmm. My question really was. The people that, that participate in the Bulls Pulse basketball program, are they county citizens? Yes. 100%. 100%. I know back in that day that I was talking about, 1996, when I was the baseball commissioner of PYA, it was 530 boys that played baseball. And it was $65 a boy or a person to play. It's $34,000. But that covers your cost for uniforms and Baseball well, and a, a I'm not going to argue with right. you. I'm, I'm just going to tell you, I did. Saying, okay, I'm not going to argue with you. I'm, tell, I'm telling you, I did. It, yeah, I know you got to buy the balls and uniforms. You got to yeah. pay the umpires, uh, the lights. At that time, I think the lights were. Uh, the county participated in some of the expense to the lights at that point. So, but my point I'm going to make to you is this, and, and I'm a big supporter of where you are, big supporter, very big. Um, and I'm glad that Megan has come on board and, uh, as Mr. Williams said, getting from A to Z. If I'd been here 10 years ago, we'd have been way past A this year, okay? I can tell you that. Um, the, uh, if the if the Little League's using the fields that the county taxpayers pay, isn't there some way that maybe we can put some type of fee into that with them? Uh, I don't think, you know, that raises the cost for those who are playing. But basketball is paying. I know what you're saying, that you, you have staff involved in air outside, you don't. Um, but is that a possibility? Is it something to at least consider to try and offset some of the expense and cost? And if we, I mean, sit down and have a conversation with the, the, the Lily, look lacrosse, uh, the soccer association. Have a conversation with them and see, you know, if there's something that they can do. I mean, the parents don't mind paying. I get sick to my stomach when I watch kids, and I know a lot of them, that leave this county and go to Chesterfield so that they can practice baseball, practice softball, practice whatever somewhere else. I, I, I know they do that. I watch parents go to Chesterfield to do aerobics, Zumba, whatever the, the program is. They go to Chesterfield. Well, while they're down there, guess what they do? They buy their gas, they go to the Burger King, they stop in Target, they do something else. That's the big picture. Is it expensive? Yeah, you're going to pay whatever, $1 million, $2 million, $5 million for a building. Of course, all relative to whatever your size is. But you have to take that first step to get beyond where you are. I'm, I'm a fan of the trails. I mean, you know, I was eight years old playing baseball. I, I would, like Steve, coached, was very involved in the youth association. When my boys were growing up, and I loved the trails. wasn't far from where Frank and I lived, called Red Lane Road, a uh, little farm called Maxie's Farm. The trail was every two every afternoon at two o'clock when I went to gather the cows up to take them in the barn to milk them. It was a nice trail. I enjoyed it. It was a great afternoon walk, except for in January when it snowed. <laughs> so, uh, Mr. Farley, I would like to say that as part of our our fee reviews. With Megan and staff, uh, there was talk of a co sponsorship fee. So basically, a flat fee per lead that they pay for the year that potentially offset some of the operational costs, uh, uh, independent of if they're using an internal facility or an external facility. Um, so we did, we have kicked that idea around. We haven't taken it to the associations and see to see how palatable that is. Uh, I know historically, the Youth associations out here try to keep the cost as low as absolutely possible. As a matter of fact, we've had neighboring competing groups ask us to raise our prices because we are, they are very conservative with mm -hmm. the fees and they want to keep it, they don't want that to be a barrier to entry for anybody. Um, and they take pride in offering 
exceptional services on exceptional facilities at a very low cost. Uh, I think spread across a multitude of the with the participation numbers back up the way they are. I think it could be more palatable. I mean, you're probably talking a couple of bucks per person that fees might have to go up, but that money has to pass along somewhere. And you do constantly hear the argument of I pay taxes in the county. Why do I have to pay an extra fee to use the facility? Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. that's that's called, you know, same thing as sitting on that board or this board. You know, somebody's not going to like what you say or do or whatever, you know, and, and, and that's part of it. Um, the, uh, the, the, the elderly aspect of this and, and the community center, I, from the beginning, I've been a supporter of that. I'm not going to flip and dip and change my mind and go a different way. Um, the, the way I look at that is, and I've had the phone calls. I don't get maybe 20 on the field. I've got them this week on lacrosse fields. And, Sure, you guys know what's going on with that. Uh, the um, but the elderly population is a growing population, and some of the phone calls that I've had was, you know, I I've, I pay taxes in this county. I don't have any children going to school in this county. You know, that's the way it works. You know, whether you're in this county or the neighboring county or wherever, you pay taxes. But these people that are the elderly, they don't have children that are in the school. They have a little bit of a, of a, of a conversation point. To come to the table with that you know they want some services too and that's the challenge that we have is how do we give services to all of these people how do we give all this money to the school system and we've got other services we have to provide for? you know how do we balance that out it's a challenge no doubt um, but when it comes to the, the community center and, and that i can tell you now i, I i'm going to be a fan of it i think it's the right thing to do um, it has a little vision to it I mean, it takes it out the county is going to uh, a, a aging population. Um, if you can't figure this part out, most of the houses you see in this county are seven hundred thousand dollars. I don't know how many young people can afford that. So when you see somebody that's a little bit more advanced in age, a little bit more beyond mid midlife, they've reached the peak of their income. They have that ability. They bought and sold a couple of houses. They can afford to buy that seven hundred thousand dollar house, and they're sixty five years old. When they buy that seven hundred thousand dollar house, at sixty five years old. They might want to go play pickleball. They might want to go play some game inside in a room. They might want to go do, do some, some uh, exercise or something like that. Fitness, wellness is the word that's coming to play. I get where you're coming from. I think you've done a tremendous job. Um, I'm not a big proponent of like this. This I don't remember the name of the company that did this, uh, but I'm going to ask this question because I think the public needs to know this. How much was this the survey? How much was this? Sixty thousand. Sixty thousand dollars. So we paid sixty thousand dollars to say, yeah, I don't like that program. Let's do something different. I, I don't think so. If you're gonna pay sixty thousand, be able to go to the experts, you might want to listen really close. The the one thing that I kind of dip back from is this was done in 2019 and 2020. And shame on us as a board, and frankly, you. Let's we should have had this conversation three years ago. We should have. You can't get to B unless you get to A. Mr. Williams comments, go to A to Z. Let's, let's get A and B and keep moving forward. Um, I do think that uh, there's, there's a money-making opportunity not to be profitable, but to be able to offset some of the costs. And I think that your expertise and your experience coming here uh, has brought a bright light to the parks and rec department. I do, and I thank you for your effort and your time. Um, that's, that's that's all I gotta say. Is there anybody else wants to talk? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sure. Uh, do take a little umbrage from time to time when people define me what I want to do. I'm the elderly population of this county. There is no single answer to that obviously uh, but i guess my concerns about the community center is a we have finite resources finite amount of time that's what we have in this county it's all we have. it is to shift away from things that are working well and need your attention like you've always just told us to file Long talk about the usage of, and so you're looking to produce new ones. 
That's the demand that's already there. That's not a demand that has to be created. We have the whole issue of what the citizens have told us. We go back and look at the list. Most of them are outdoor, outdoor activities. Shooting ranges. They didn't say archery, they said shooting ranges. They talked about walking, trail, fishing. And so those are those are activities in the rural world. Those are the ones that I grew up with in rural South Carolina. So my concern is that you shift any of your resources. You start off with this whole other world called community center. You're shifting your resources. It's already been defined. It's going to be hard to fund. What you want now is going to be hard to fund. Yeah. It really is. So that's my concern. Because we have, we have, we, we understand what is working well. And we should be building on that. And we've got a ways to go to get that demand satisfied without going out and looking for another demand. We're not going to have the money to meet every demand that every person wants. Never works that way, or should we? So, I like your study. I like where it's led you, uh, and I'm concerned. We'll be talking about this in a minute. I'm start talking about money. Uh, I'm concerned about our ability to fund what it is that you want today. Uh, and so, that's my concern. So we we'll go off on a new venture, and we haven't finished the one that we set ourselves up. So we've got some really interesting points. So that's my concern. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, sir, Mr. Goss. Do you think you can do any action today practically with this and the bylaws say the set for any period of time to be completely uh, uh, changes now? If you all if you are okay with uh looking at these bylaws, we have them uh prepared for April 2014. Okay. There's no concerns with putting those together with the work that they don't need to work How about um, at the same time, uh, maybe we can uh, discuss the, the, the funding or the um, analysis that they want to do to whether this is a feasible feasibility. So what we do. We bring that out uh, next month or two. Okay. Um, I would like to add that um, Megan has also put together a there's an online survey right now to, to bridge that gap with the two year difference there because we did the, the statistically valid study was 2020 it was completed and Megan has uh, taken it upon herself to to get more current data from the community and has advertised it in every avenue that there is available to her and I believe you're uh, how many folks do you have so far responses Over so we're about at half the numbers of the, the ones that we had sent already so that would be supplemental data to the current data so we can get a more accurate picture of what the citizens of Powhatan are feeling would be a, a need so pickleball folks, folks showed up hey exactly <laughs> and the, the pickle the pickleball is I walked out there and man, you want that is a they are an active you, you group. Do, you take your life in your own hands. That's <laughs> awesome. That's some people that you know. That was an easy. It was a retrofit to existing facilities. It was two right. tennis courts. We turned it into right. six pickleball courts, right. and they're packed seven days a week. Right. And they would follow you around. If you said they have the fields. Everywhere I went, there was somebody going to pick them up. And you don't fix our courts. Yep. No, I went by there Sunday in the parking lot's packed with cars. Yeah. And people standing all around. Yeah. I mean, and during the winter, during the daytime, I mean, they were trying to get inside as often as they can. So, and then, also, you know, that complements some of the nighttime activities because they can participate during the day. So, it's so Mr. Used. Chairman, let me see if I understand. We're doing a pickleball survey, or we doing the survey? <laughs> no, it's, it's 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 the same questionnaire as we sent out originally. Yeah. Um, just to update. Oh, so when, you, when you say originally, as, as part of the pros consulting one. That is the same one you sent out back in 2019. I believe it's a couple of modified questions. questions there. 
it's targeted towards the uh, 55 plus community or uh, adults who will be turning 55 in the next 15 years, specifically to collect that data when we were looking for data to support the senior center. That was the direction. However, I think that we could promote a survey that would be more broad to attract all the graphics versus focusing on that one. But that was the I'm not going to lie. Okay. okay. Yeah. Sure. One last question. How long have you been on this committee, Mr. Conwell? Five, six years. Mr. Flanagan? Uh, since you started? I yeah, started. I'm one of the originals. Charter member? Yeah. Almost. Frank and I. Well. Sam. Six years? Yes. Thank you. Another pay really good. Fantastic. The benefits are good too. Absolutely. <laughs> I appreciate it very much. Thank you guys. Okay. Moving right along. Old business. So we have a uh, discussion on the FY24 budget and CIP. So at the uh, last meeting, um, for a presentation, I'm going to second but at the last meeting, uh, the board adopted the Tax rate is 69 cents and uh, directed us to compare uh, budget amendments in line with that. Uh, so we can go through uh, where we've been and what we have for each money. Next steps we have a public hearing on our budget and our uh, fee schedule Monday at Monday's meeting. And then uh, hopefully we can adopt the budget on May 1st. That's what we've been planning so far. Do you want to adopt the budget on May 1st? Well, we, that means we're not going to be voting on right. uh, April 24th. And the code section requires you to be sent to the public hearing. The public hearing is going to be held on the, on the 24th. 24th. Yes, sir. Six three. So we'll have two more, after this, two more budget meetings, technically, we can talk about the 24th as well as May 1st. Yeah, right. we can absolutely discuss it on the 24th. No. Just can't pass it back. You can, and I would expect you to do the discussion. We do not have to adopt. We, we, I'm not the expert in it. I, I don't know. State, you have to leave if you don't want to. Have, at least the schools has to be done by May 15th. So, or a portion of it. Yeah. So, but that's right. But the county part we could have to go later. Sure. Um, so, just looking uh, at the timeline here on our, our budget of where we've been process so far. Started uh, with presenting the budget on February 23rd, March 6th, uh, had initial discussion on that, then March 8th, uh, joint school board meeting. March 16th, uh, additional discussion, March 20th, uh, additional discussion on it. So I think just uh, also for the public to see, you know, how much thought and discussion the staff has gone into this and between each of these meetings you know it's not like we uh, don't speak between those so meeting with each of you individually throughout the weeks and getting information going back and forth so just want to highlight besides the public meetings that they see how much work goes into this from staff and the board uh, so then most recently march 27th had a public hearing on our tax rate uh, 28th we looked at some different scenarios on uh, the board said um, give us direction to look at 69 cents or to get as close as we could. April 3rd, uh, we proposed initially a 70 uh, cent scenario with options for how to get to 69 cents. And um, the board asked us to, uh, or the board uh, adopted that 69 cents. And then here tonight, looking at that budget, uh, just so to go into Monday's public hearing on it. So this uh, personnel on the next slide. This is uh, what you've seen before. So the gray ones. Go to the next slide. Uh, the ones up top there are new positions uh, added. The red are positions that we entered as part of this budget. And then the ones at the bottom are not new positions, but uh, either pay increases uh, or things tied to. And then the next two slides go through the list of CIP projects as proposed. We have a 
they have set tables for you as well. And then uh, then we have a comparison on the next slide of where others are currently. Um, just wanted to show that uh, one thing early on, I think what we talked about was ideally if we target more and more just, uh, below the rate of inflation. So you can see some other few are either neighboring, regional, or similarly situated localities, what their current budgets are looking like this year. Many of them have similar uh, increases, a lot of that driven by inflation, and then also some of just the, uh, the rising assessments that we're seeing as well. So they have different needs, they have different parties in their communities, so not saying one right is right or wrong, but uh, we are proud that we're seeing our spending rose to the rise of a liar, lower rate than others in the region or similar localities. Uh, similarly, on the next slide, showing the uh, tax rates. Uh, originally, when this board came in 2020, we were of this peer group, uh, the highest. As you can see, uh, each year since then, we've, we've started to uh, work our way down the tax rate to where now we're kind of in the middle, middle group there of uh, where our tax rate stands. And then the next slide shows uh, this is a projection from our uh, financial model forecast. So you can see the proposed budget currently um, until about 2027 uh, on a good path. And again, many, many assumptions in this. Between now and the end of this model, many things for better and for worse will change. Um, so, uh, but this assumes if, if we don't change anything and all of the assumptions come true, that's what we would be uh, looking at. So, in the some of the out years that uh, trajectory starts to go down where to correct that we are going to see our inflation <laughs> increasing uh, or we need to uh, cut or reduce our spending in those years. So certainly we would never um, get to that point. We're going to make adjustments each year before we get there, um, but it is good to look at what the long-term impacts of some of our decisions are. And then the last slide here is just a summary of the proposed uh, FY24 budget um, at the 69 cent approved tax rate. So, available to answer any questions on this. Yes, sir, Mr. Gotch. Um, I'd like, I'm confused, Brad, about um, the, you have a final, you have Page six. I will highlight. You've got seven percent raise for the county, one point two million, the third one. So, uh, in schools, four hundred fifty k county cost. Explain to me why you have four hundred fifty thousand dollars in. For the school, you reduced the school transfer by half a million dollars from, mm -hmm. from their original request. Then you added back the four hundred fifty thousand. What is the four hundred fifty thousand for? That is for the potential of the state adding uh, two percent on top of the five percent. Uh, so that was something where the state is not passed a budget. We understand they probably won't pass one until June at this point. Uh, so there's. Different scenarios out there for a 5% raise, a 5 plus a 2% raise. Uh, currently, the school is basing their projections on uh, the skinny budget, which does not have a 2%. Um, so, this 450 would be that 2%, which uh, schools is, is currently not asking for. Um, the reason we've kept it in is, is the situation we would want to avoid is if we take it out of the budget, then the state comes back, uh, General Assembly comes back in June, reconvenes and approves 5 plus 2%. Then we would either have to, to not do it um, or find 450000 somewhere else in the RV approved budget, which would be difficult. Okay. Let's go back through that again because it gets confused. It's Schools the county's. Are, well, 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 please, please. Let me ask the question, then you can answer. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Schools are basing their budget off of like 5% increase. Correct. Okay. So, uh, if in fact it comes, the budget comes through by the state at 5%. There's no need for the four hundred fifty thousand dollars. Correct. Okay. Uh, so if the state comes through at seven percent, five plus two, then they get the two percent from the state. There's no need for the four hundred fifty thousand dollars from the county. That that is our portion of the two percent. So to to do the state's two percent, we would be 
contribute before. That's the um, expenditure in excess of the revenue we get from the state is to make whole the it's the it's the county share shared cost to it's just if the county decided to do that. Yes, sir. Yes. So if the county got seven percent, so so if the, if the state says we're going to give you seven percent five plus two, then that requires us and we then requires us to give them four hundred fifty thousand so they can have a seven percent raise. Then it requires us to match that with county employees for seven percent raise. Is that correct? So suddenly we now we've, we've taken a portion of the money that the state the state's going to give us a portion of the money to fund the schools, and we're going to turn that into a much bigger check uh, for salaries changes in the county. Correct. We so the four hundred fifty thousand. What would be the two percent on, on, on the county side? That is the four hundred fifty thousand. Oh, the county side. The county side. What, so now we're going from five to seven percent. Yeah. It's about yeah. yeah. Three hundred forty thousand is the county's so portion this, for our employees. So that scenario says we'll go up seven hundred fifty thousand dollars. Yes. Okay. Uh, I think that's the school in every Okay. So the schools. Are getting a transfer of 7.8 percent. Is that right? I'm on highlights page six. Yes. Okay, which is two percent, two pennies more than the county scheme, which is 5.8, or is 5.8 the total? 5.8 is the that's the total. That's the total. Okay, so it's the, the spread is even more. So the county, the county is getting much less than the schools. Is that is that what I'm? Yes, we're increasing our spending at a, a lower rate. Okay, so this all up is 5.8. The schools are 7.8, so that means the county side is going to be something less than five. Oh, that's that percentage of the total, uh, total yeah. is 5.8. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the schools are getting we're getting an increase of 7.8. Oh, 5.8. So, uh, uh, just 5 .8. the local transfer. So, we're, 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 so the, the county thing. side is less than, okay? I'm just trying to figure out how we're about, who we're balancing this budget. Uh, I'd like to go, we'll get that way. Okay, okay no reason to worry about that. That's the number I'd like to know. I'd like to go to the fund balance. Page 12. Actually, not page 12. I gave, uh, there's a slide. Okay, and everybody has a copy of that slide. That's it. Okay. Uh, this is essentially taking the curve above the blue line and breaking it into its component parts. Mr. Bo, you created this. Would you like to explain the components? Uh, yes, sir. It's it's a bit hard to see in the screen, but I guess we can just focus on the first few this year so you can zoom in on the left side of the screen there. You can zoom in where it uh, says 69 cents in the bottom left corner. Thank you. So to begin, we have uh, the revenue expenditure surplus slash deficit. If the number's in parentheses, that's the surplus. If it's in red, it's a deficit. Um, so and that's, that's the money left over after we run through running the county each year. Prior to any transfers? Correct. Yeah. Prior to any transfers. And we'll see that in um, FY30, you'll begin running a deficit there. If you include transfers, um, utilities, as well as your CIP um, and your, your new debt service, where it says surplus or use of fund balance, that's how much you're gaining or using in your fund balance. Then. So the yellow, line is, the yellow line is the change in your fund balance. Correct. And depending upon how much you spend on CIP projects, it can make it positive or negative. 
Yes, as well as your, your surplus or deficit revenues expenditures. And then the, the last line is your fund balance after taking out your 15% assigned fund balance. So it's the amount of money left over that you can use for CFP, for instance. Um, yes, sir. No, that's, that's it. Um, can I ask a question off that? Sure, sure. The fund balance net 15%. So that's the blue, 15 is the blue line. Right, right, right. But so say we're going in the out years and you're at fiscal year 2032. Are you saying that the we will the blue line is lower or the monies? The the orange line, it's essentially going to be the distance between the orange and blue right, line. Right. So we never still will use that 15 percent. It's just well, in this case you will. Um it's but it's all a hypothetical. This is your spin. You, will you won't be able to, but uh, like, this is showing that you of your of the fifteen of the fifteen percent. That's what I'm trying yeah. to get clear. Okay. This fifteen percent is um is of of total expenditures, okay. so it's a set value. Now, to better understand this, uh, Mr. McClung, you wanted uh, sixty nine cents, not seventy cents. Okay, so that reduced this year twenty twenty four five hundred sixty thousand dollars. Okay. Not, none of the numbers are good or bad, they're just what the numbers are. But what that meant is it took five million six hundred thousand out of this tenure. And that's what that's what it does. Or um, more than that because of um, the growth rate in your uh, real estate base. Um, 560 at 3 percent next year would be more than that, and then so on and so forth. Okay, so exponential. So when you look, you know, ah. that's the whole point of this, it takes it, it takes it straight on down the line. Now, when I first looked at this, uh, I looked at uh, the year of uh, uh, FY 2032, where we actually go negative, we go below the blue line. Uh, and so, uh, but I said, okay, I've got till 2032 to do something. But the reality is that's wrong. Uh, and uh, that was one of the modifications, Mr. Moe. Well made. So you'll see new debt service. That's right. Up, uh, that's the third from the bottom. New debt service. Okay. And so what happens is in FY 2025, that's where we borrow eight million dollars for parks and rec, and six million dollars for school, fourteen million dollars, and Mr. Byerly put it. Yep, we're going to have to borrow. That's $14 million. So now you see the interest cost of that. And that interest cost is going to go out, Charlotte, 20 years? Yes. 20 years. So you're going to have $3 million for 20 years. And so you can't wait and say, well, we don't really have to worry about the until we can make these out years that's so far out. But the decisions that are made about 2025. In terms of how much money we're going to borrow and if we're going to borrow, are going to have a major impact in terms of what happens to our fund balance over the next 20 years. Uh, that says at $560,000 for a penny uh, parks and rec interest charge. Uh, theoretically, this is, this is interest for schools and you. It's, it's five pennies, okay? That's another way to look at it. It's going out over time. Is how much, what's that do to the tax rate? And so uh, I look at this, okay? And <clears throat> the variables are pretty simple. And it's always laid them out. When you've got income, okay? Can we get more income? Historically, the way you get more income if you're a government entity is send taxpayer another bill. Boom, easy, done. Uh, no, it doesn't have to be that way. But in fact, uh, if you don't like this uh, graph and what, what it shows us, uh, is you either have to increase your revenue or you go in and you re re decrease your CIP. This CIP was created by a former county administrator in 2021-22 era with a lot more money coming in. That's just facts. And we haven't adjusted the reality of moving from something like 77 cents to 69 cents. And so uh, I look at this and what it tells me is I cannot support uh, our CIP uh, that's in our budget because it just, I'm sorry, not the way it is. Uh, 
we need to go back and look at our projects and, and find out which ones we're going to do. What are our options? You can move them out in time. Uh, you can do some of them. Uh, there, are, there are a lot of different options. But in fact, uh, we need to spend some time looking at uh, what we're going to do with our CIP. The, the one thing about this is we've never had this kind of information before. We really haven't. We haven't been able to see the impact over time of making these decisions like borrowing uh, this amount of money now and then four years later is killing, okay, uh, unless you're doing something different. And so, uh, Mr. Bo's done a wonderful job of putting this information together and laying it out in a way that's understandable uh, so that we have tools that we've never had before. So, going forward, and uh, if the citizens have me, I will be going forward. Uh, when we're looking at the budget, we've got to look at it really in two major groups. We've got our operating budget, which is what we normally focus on. And then we've got to take a look at the same time, uh, with the same, same information, what we're going to spend on capital projects, uh, excuse me, our CIP going out 10 years. Now, the CIP has two distinct components to it. The first is maintenance. We've got roofs. We've got new fire engines. We've got new buses. We've got things. Um, <clears throat> those, those, those are things that we, we have to look at and we have to plan for. Yeah. Roof on this building, but it's a bit of a million. Yeah. Yeah. They're pumps, so we have, to, we have to plan those. But those are things that, uh, that when you put them on, you run in real peril. For providing the basic services for this county. And then the second component of the CFP uh, really is what do you want to do new? What do you what difference? Do? One of the things we all were discussing tonight is a community center. That would be a, a new thing. And so you really have to look at your CIP and think about it in both of those terms. We now have the information it's just coming online. Unfortunately, this information was available last year. We had a county administrator who did not want to see it out there. We did not want to see it broken out so it could be used. We have it now. Uh, it's a great working tool. Um, we have to remind ourselves uh, that uh, the, dotted, the, the dotted line, which is a projected line, red line, is surrounded by shades of gray. And that's because these are all projections. Okay. Uh, and that's what they are. They're the best projections we have. Uh, but everything past uh, 2022 uh, is projected. Uh, now, we're getting, uh, Mr. Bo, you told me when we look back over your shoulder at the 2022 projections, how did they turn? They were very close. No. So we, we, we've been able to test it one time. That's all. We've been able to test it one time. And it kind of passed its test the first time. I don't know what's going to happen. We continue to have the volatility uh, that we've had in terms of revenue, both up and down over the past few years. Um, hopefully, we won't have any major um, health issues that screw everything. Okay, I mean, just everything. So, uh, I'm concerned uh, with a CIP that looks like this projection shows us. And I think it I think it needs some work. I don't have I don't have the answer. I don't have any answer. I don't have any suggestions for you to see. Other than uh, we need to spend some time on it. And that's one of the reasons why I ask about that May date. Uh, I don't know what the uh, attitude of the other board members are in terms of wanting to spend more time on the CIP, but that's where I'm at. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Cox. Mr. Chairman, yes. yeah. can we, uh, one thing with the CIP, we can pass the budget with this year's CIP in May and then look at our comp the CIP in a comprehensive standpoint at a later date. Am I correct? I mean, the, for the budget purposes, yeah. the only thing you need to know is what you're planning on spending this year on the CIP. $3 million. Correct. Yeah, so that we know that should we spend that or not would be the question for the budget. Well, if you really want to have a budget that makes some sense, okay, you are going to be looking at the 10 years, not at just the one year. But we have time, is what I'm saying. We have, we have time. Yeah. 
But I mean, but, yeah, you gotta look at you look at the three million. Is there something you want to pitch out yeah. or push forward or, or whatever? But in fact, the 2025 budget is something we really should be talking about today, okay? Because that's 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 where the big lump comes in. Okay? And so, yes, to pass a budget, you're absolutely right. But in fact, if we're going to do our little due diligence, Correct. we think we need to be looking about what's going forward. Is that it? Just a change. Yes, sir, Mr. McClellan. Make the record clear how you change the same tax rate to 69 cents. It's letting that pay. Okay. Thank you, sir. I'll never regret it. But that's my constituents are very happy. It wasn't. No, 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 you no. voted for it too. Yeah, I voted for it too. Yeah. It, what, it, it, it isn't. It's, yeah. these, these are just numbers. They're not. The really hypothetical bad. numbers. You sure that the okay. okay. all did a great job. The whole staff did an excellent job. You like to talk, Mr. Ray? Oh, you want to comment? I didn't think it was going to be a need to. Uh, she got two choices. You go ahead and run on CRP, knowing that it's got problems, going out. The whole purpose of 10 years CRP is something I recommended back to the former board. It got adopted under this board was to be able not to look at capital improvement plans, budgets, and a silo, but to be able to look at over time to understand how your decisions today affected your planning going out, not just one year, but five, 10 years into the future. My recommendation stemmed from previous board's decision, which I was a part of and did not vote for increasing our financial policy to 15%, where our debt could equal 15% of our expenditure budget. I thought it was a crazy decision at that time, and I wanted to get it back down underneath 12 as soon as possible. One of the ways that we could do that was to look at it and see how we could layer in debt going out into the future. And at that time, we were concentrating on going out to market. What it was going to cost us to be able to go for the major projects, to be able to layer in a new school, for example, so that we would know going out five years, if we had to do an elementary school or in addition to the high school, our capacity to layer in new debt would be there. But again, it was going out to market. What Tommy and Mr. Cox have done is they've given us a more granular view of what it means to go ahead and plan 10 years using not only going out to market, paying that principal and interest and having that ability, but also pay as you go. Having the money that we bring in every year over here available to be able to do the funding of not just your principal and interest of going into market, but to be able to pay for your pay as you go projects as well. So it's a combination. So, what this has shown us that with the current tax rate of 69 cents, like Mr. Cox said, doesn't work going out. It worked this year. Of course, any budget will work this year. But it doesn't meet well of what we intended for a 10 year CIP. Now, Mrs. Carmack is right. We don't have to pass it today. We don't have to pass it this month. But I believe what we should do, the other option, is to go back and to take this information that Mr. Bo has brought forward with Mr. Cox take a look at the 10 year CIP to see how we can make what we intended when we started down this path of the 10 year CIP to make it valid. 
So I'm going to support Mrs. Carmack's recommendation that we go back, look at it, do what we need to do to come into conformity with what we intended to do with the 10 year CIP, knowing that we can't necessarily do it when we intended to do it, but we might be able to do it the next month or the subsequent month. And we've done that before. Fred's nodding his head. I can, I can remember one time, what was it, October? Charlotte probably got a better number than all of us. Usually yeah. yeah. So it's, we can do it. The question is whether or not we want to do it. And I'm going to be in favor of the last. I'd also like to mention, since um, we're there around the October date, uh, October, November, that's around the time I'll get the finished financials for this year, in which case I can use to update the financial forecasts and as well as any growth rates from the latest um, sort of data. It'll just give us a one year further accurate picture forecasting out. It, I understand. That graph will look completely different. I understand. I would like to mention we have done it in October before, but we have approved certain things to go ahead to be July 1, such as your share vehicles. I mean, you may be into wanting to, if you're all okay with 24, we can go with 24 and then have a heavy dive in 25 through the rest and amend that. That's up to you guys, but I don't want to hold up because there's timing issues with some of our, our share vehicles and things like that, that some of that we have done where we've said, okay, we'll approve and appropriate these things and then look at everything else going forward and have that in October. Uh, we, done our shares vehicles in we did, we did the actual, per yeah, we did the purchase of the vehicle, but no money for the equipment to install it. So we tried to do, because of the market of those things, they have to go earlier, but. but Charles, they have to do things. You can identify what they are in a dollar mm -hmm. amount. And if we need to address that, we could. Mm -hmm. That's what you're saying. Tommy, you okay with that? Yes, sir. Up to the board. Um, thank you for those comments, Mr. Williams. On this fund balance chart here, we have the man of the day, Mr. Bob. What's the inflation, rate of inflation that you're assuming? Um, for it's, it's probably a thousand different growth rates, depending on what you're asking specifically. We have hundreds of revenues accounts and hundreds of expenditure accounts. The amount of inflation for the next 10 years, you've got to be plugging in some number there, right? Yes. What's, so what's that number? So it's it's not a specific number. Each it's, revenue we review and look at the growth over time, what we history has and apply what we think that growth rate is going to be. So each on the revenue side, each revenue could have a separate growth percentage rate. That's what he's saying. It's kind of like the assessments went up fifteen percent this year, right? Correct. Well, what if what do you what's your number for next year projected? Um, for real estate or yeah, I can see. For FY25, yes, 5%. If, if you go to FY26, how much are you expecting the real estate assessments to increase in FY26? 3% and then we have a long-term growth rate of 2%. Okay, so what you're doing is you're saying with this whole chart, everything we see here, the real estate assessments are gonna go up potentially 5% next year. Yes, sir. And in FY25. And in FY26, potentially they're gonna go up 3%. Yes, sir. And then from that point out through 2033, you're just using a flat 2%. Yes, and we, we are using baseline um, growth rates for our expen on our expenditure side, so our operating. We have long-term growth rates of 3%, except for FY24, we did factor some larger increases just from the cost of goods. Um, and wages, we have long-term growth Slow down, because you're going a little bit too fast, it's okay? Right. So your growth rate, you know, we've got the, the real estate. You're figuring it's going to be 5% next year, 3% the next year, 2% 
for the following years after that through yes. 2033. So what happens to this chart if we have that year like we had this year where the assessments go up 10% or 15%? What happens to the, the 69? Especially with real estate, it being such a um, large portion of our revenue stream. How much is it? You say it's a large portion. How much is it? Um, I don't know the specific percentage, but um, I think Charlotte can actually tell us right now. Right. Yeah. Thank you. I'm resting. I'll start Tom, go ahead and give me that growth rate. I mean, what, what, you're, what you're using with the growth rate in, in FY25. Okay, um, that, that'd be 5%. So the growth rate for FY25 is 5%. What's the growth rate for FY26? Uh, 3% and then 2%. And then, then you go to the 2%. The, the yeah. yeah, so I guess to give a general answer, if, if we have a growth rate that's drastically different than what we're projecting, let's say it's higher, mm -hmm. um, revenues of real estate being such a large portion of our revenues, which will give you the exact percentage, this graph will drastically change because um, one, a a growth rate change in one year will flow through each subsequent year, um, compounding the growth year right. over year. Even if every year thereafter is a three or two or even a one percent, that that uh, your denominator is so much larger now as you grow out. So so it's very sensitive. It's very sensitive to changes in right. In the, the growth, growth rate. rate is yes, sir. What was the growth rate we used for this past year? Uh, for 23, I don't have that in this specific forecast. Oh, wait, for 23, we have, um, we didn't have a growth rate because we have the, um, the real estate book. So we, we use a, uh, we use the 97% collection rate of the, of the total levy that we got from James. Now, compared to the previous year before that, then it would just be the, the growth and, um, the, the assessment. So 15% of the So it's an actual growth rate, right? Yeah. So what's your percentage of inflation that you're using? Uh, inflation and growth rate to me are so, same, same thing. Yes, sir. basically. All right. For benefits? 7%. So you're figuring the benefits are 7%, right? Yes. And for instance, for FY24, uh, it should be less than that, which we've adjusted because we didn't have a health insurance increase. Right. So we so, so the, the health insurance increase the previous year was 19%. Yes, sir. How's that going to affect this chart if it's 19% next year? Oh, not yeah. much, right? Um, it it'll have a so it'll have a um, a, a noticeable impact in our, our, our so yeah. Did you get that number, Charlotte? Of just the general fund revenue, it's fifty-four percent of our state tax. And I can provide the board scenarios of uh, even just a one-year change in growth rate. It being we're assuming five, seven, nine, or eleven percent. Would you do that, please? Yes, sir. Oh, that'd be great. Thank you very much. Have you computed in in this what type of raises the the, the county's going to pay out each year to I'm assuming school and What's the raise number? Yes, sir. Percentage? Um, it's the long term growth rate is 3%. So you're just using a flat 3% each year? Yes, sir. And this year, how much? We're doing 5% this year, right? Maybe 7 7, seven, seven Maybe is seven. the current projection. Uh, so if two years ago, if we would have left our tax rate at 79 cents for this past year, previous year, left our tax rate at 79 cents. Just off the cuff, I'm not, you know, yes, sir. I have this idea. chart would look completely different. We'd be way above the line, wouldn't we? Yes. But we did. We lowered it two pennies to 77 cents, right? Yes. Sir. Okay. But had we done the, the 79 cents, because one of the questions that I was thinking about when you guys were bringing this up, when you look at this chart, the tax rate's got to stay at 69 cents for this chart to be even feasible. That was up there in the chart. It's, it's, for it to be feasible, it's got to stay at 69 cents, right? Uh, as far as a minimum or maximum? The rate. This this it's graph, the line change. is yes. Yes. Assuming the right. assumption is 69 yes. cents for the next nine yes. years. And, and, and that's something uh, Mr. Cox was emphasizing, which is um, 
this this forecast graph it's assuming any decisions you make in yep. July you'll no longer be making any other decisions that would change this in the next ten years. And that's unrealistic. That's that's, that's not, what? What did you just that's say? That's unrealistic. It's it not going to happen. It's completely unrealistic. It's, it's not going to happen. And I appreciate this. Trust me. Your work is, is very valuable. And I agree that you need to have some type of guideline to look at and go with that. But you need to understand what this is. And when the right. public's listening uh, for two minutes on here or five minutes or however long, and they hear tidbits of this conversation, the graph basically is unrealistic unless you're going to leave your tax rate at 69 cents and all these assumptions that you say are true and they could be i, I wouldn't be yes. the one to question it but I, I i could say you know in palatine county when was the last time that this tax rate in this county bear in mind i've been here since 1963 when was the last time the tax rate stayed the same for nine years like ever I don't think the assessment stayed the same for nine years. I don't think inflation stayed the same for nine years. I like the chart. I like that the information information is always good, but I don't want to mislead anybody and put the fear of God in them that the world's going to stop turning. The GTP, GDP is all of a sudden in crisis and we're going to flounder here. That's not what's going on. Yes, we'll adjust for we'll that as every and that's every just minute. my opinion. I don't perceive that at all. Okay, great. Uh public comment period is over. Mr. Chair, we're not finished. Well, we are finished. No, we're not public finished. comment period we're not is over. If anybody like to we're come on and comment on the so I have not finished okay. with the discussion. Does anybody want to speak? If you do, right. now's your time. He has a right to speak. Now is your time. Mr. Barley. Mr. Okay. Barley, will you recognize me, please? It, do you recognize him? Mr. Oliver, would you like to speak? Uh, yes, I would just like to speak. This is wrong. I support uh, uh, the PR uh, seats. I support the PR 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 seats. I support the um, I am yeah, a speaker supporter of the community center. Um, uh, speaking to the board about this uh, for almost two years now. Uh, certainly, uh, we have some comments that you can let know who the senior action committee is. The same people who have been speaking in front of the board for two years. Um, we've met with most of the board members here. There is some people on the board who have refused to meet with us and have a conversation about this. Um, so I am in support of that. You know, not just as a senior, but as a citizen in this county. Uh, I've been hearing for two years we're going to wait for some Department of DCU Gerontology and Care Connection survey. Well, that's not happening. Um, I personally have spoken to DCU Gerontology and know nothing about a survey in how my spouse has personally spoken to the director of care coordination. They know nothing of a survey and they don't plan a survey. We just continue to get these, well, we'll get, we'll do this, we'll hear that, and we'll go on to that. Um, no, the Senior Action Committee is not a like, government sanctioned, it's not a committee sanctioned by the board. There is no board sanctioned looking at senior services in this county. We've asked for that for two years and it hasn't happened. What I keep hearing is some reason why we can't do it. So I urge the, the board to vote um, to support a feasibility study or a community center that has a senior focus in this county. Um, all the data suggests it, it is undeniable that we're an aging population. That is undeniable. And whether you call it 55, it is nationally recognized that 55 is a senior. Some folks may think it's 65, they're wrong. It is nationally recognized as a, as a 55 number. So I, I just want people to, to be honest about what they're talking about. If they want to know what the Senior Act Committee has had conversations about, then I would encourage you to meet with them when that, when that is offered. And I do appreciate the people that have met with us and had that conversation. No, we're not an official committee, but we do have lots of conversations with lots of people in this county, and lots of age groups that think and that also agree that it is a uh, needed item in, in the county. 
Thank you, Joe. Anyone else? Okay. Yes, sir. Good evening, everybody. I'm Pete McAteer, 4224 Pierce Road. Um, I am the current president of Housing Relief. Just uh, uh, handed the reins back in the And I just wanted to speak out in, in support of our Parks and Rec Department. Zach coming on board here recently. I just focus on athletics, his energy and attention to detail. Um, we have seen a big step change, not only in our leadership of the top end of the league, but um, parks and rec. Um, the things that they're trying to do to help support us and support the kids. Um, we talked about some numbers earlier. We're just under 500 kids playing baseball. We're almost back to our, our pre pandemic levels. Probably ran it out pretty many We've got uh, 40 teams, 230 registered volunteers with background checks. We had a great opening ceremony this past weekend. We got the help of Parks and Rec as well. We had that summer. That's a game that lies well. Came in a little bit late, but uh, a lot of kids are really well pleased to see them. Um, the future is bright for, for, for baseball. Uh, we were trying to do some things too. You mentioned earlier about uh, kids leaving the county to play ball. One of the reasons they go outside the county to play ball is in Chesterfield, they have indoor facilities. We do not have an indoor facility. We have no indoor training facilities, no indoor adding cages, anything like that. So they have to go out this way. Um, so, speaking in support of that and expanding it. Uh, facilities. If we want to keep some of these kids playing baseball, and one of the things I want to do, one of my key strategic objectives is to partner with those travel teams, kids, the teams that are going outside of the facilities. We have resident travel teams. I, I have my own travel team for five years um, here in Palatine. I make it predominantly 95 plus percent kids from Palatine. I occasionally have a couple of kids or um, in fact, I'm always happy when we mail it. So, um, that was one of my mailing kids. Um, keeping the cost down, that was a comment you made earlier about adding cost. I, I agree. The kids are going to, the parents are going to say, well, where, where are we paying taxes? Where are we paying for these fields? If we do need to adjust and to create some kind of piece in there for feed or to recover expenses and support what we're doing, we just need to know that so that we can adjust and set the fees appropriately and set expectations. And I need to be able to operate um, and express that to our constituency within how to how can really, um, it's math. It's, it's not hard to add in four dollars, five dollars, whatever we have. We're talking about also we have some out of county residents, out of county players. He's about 15, is that what I 15 out of 470 um, are out of county. Our, but our Power 10 Little League, our Little League boundaries do encompass Cumberland and Cody. We just have it. We're not going after those leagues. Those are there. Dixie, you coached out here before you coached. It was Dixie, Dixie. You. Okay. I helped Shepherd 10 years ago. It's been 10 years in the Little League. I helped Shepherd us out of Dixie Little League. Dixie Youth to Power uh, and uh, we did that so that we could be more par and get higher competition. We won everything. How can we had to split our, split our teams up? Because we went, we went to the region, we went to the states. We even went to national competitions. I took a coach match team to national competitions. Um, we did that to raise our, raise our game. And what we're trying to do is get some of these better ball players, the ones that are going out of the county spend money out of the county or back in the county. Yeah, so there's an there's an economy there that's that's leaving the county. Uh, we are focused on rec baseball, fun for the kids. Play safe, learn baseball, practice good sportsmanship, play with your friends, compete with your friends, and and, and above all what Powhatan Little League is to operate with transparency and to have an operating budget and to run the league as a business, which it is not what we see through the organization. So we're here. We've got a great board, nine members, including myself, that are tireless, 
focused on the kids, advocates for the kids. And uh, we just we appreciate everything that you all are doing. We appreciate the conversation, the analysis. I was one of the 200 people that said, I am a senior, I guess. Thanks for the fight. We'll come back to some but anyway, thank you all very much. For raising the time. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, on. Ms. Weir? Yes, sir. If you state your name and address, yes, speak sir. a little bit. This is Debbie Weir. I live at 1501 Page Road. And I was very intrigued in the fact that there is a survey that's been advertised for um, the Parks and Rec and um, the people's interest in the county. However, I was wondering where it is because I have not seen it. I religiously read the Power 10 today and I just looked at Parks and Rec site and I did not see it. So if someone could point me in their direction and maybe advertise on their, on y'all's website, that would be good. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Can I follow up? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, the survey was posted on our website. It was just recently taken down because with the timeline to complete the survey was, was complete. Uh, it was also posted on our social media page. We have a Facebook page. And it was also advertised in Palatine today. And copies, printed copies were available in the community center. I spoke at the Rotary Club, and they were also available in the library to pick up. What's the name of your page? Palatine Parks and Recreation. Palatine County Parks and Recreation. Palatine County Parks and Recreation. Okay. Hopefully that helps you out, Ms. Weir. She gone? She gone. She gone. Anyone else? Good. All right. We'll close public comment period. County Administrator comments. No comments. Board comments, Mr. Cox. Well, yeah, board comments. If you'd like to say something, I'd stop. I haven't asked for any board comments. Good. Anyone else? 